All right. Let's get going, shall we? Uh, just making sure everything's working. Is it working? Is it working? Yes, it's working. Everything's on. We're going to do this. I have something really fun to announce this week that I've been working on. You'll now get bookmarks in real time as we go through the different topics for, how's it going, Quint, for uh, learning web design as we go through. And that's really great because that way, uh, you know, we can have that. Uh, for the sake of this video, uh, this walkthrough of learning web design, I will be uh, periodically looking at YouTube and Twitch chat as well as IRC. If you want to know more about any of that, go to rwxrob.live, uh, which has, which I've recently improved um, to just be a simpler page and it has links to other stuff. Uh, chat is the link that will give you the IRC chat. Uh, if you want to check the schedule, this is something I really, really like today. I just fixed. Uh, you can see my personal schedule here and specifically when the, the, the changes are to the stream, if any. Um, if, if I am guaranteed to be streaming, I'm going to list it as a stream there. I know it's not a very pretty schedule, but it at least will we'll cover cover the task. Um, and if, uh, a lot of times when during work uh, or doing mentoring, I'll be streaming as well, like as, as I have all day this morning. All right. Well, let's get back to it. So we are all about... Um, you know, learning web design. And um, I'm going to go ahead and pull that, that document up for you. Uh, it, this is a time change. So if, uh, um, you know, if you are unaware of, you know, when and where this all goes, let me go show you that real quick. So that's on, on YouTube. If you go to the playlist, uh, I'll do a little bit more orientation here than I normally would because some of you are going to be in a different time zone So you're going to be wondering what's going on um, And so the beginner boost series are right here uh, This there's quite a few there's you know a couple dozen hours of content there. That's not bookmarked yet So uh, if you're getting getting ready to go through learning web design or you want to do it I'd suggest holding off on going through that content until I get time to go through it all again and put bookmarks in it but as of today, uh, I'll be doing those bookmarks dynamically as we go through the content so that you can go back and, and grab it whenever you need it. Um, and that's, that's actually really important to me because I, I don't want you guys to, to miss out on that. Um, uh, and, you know, it's have to slug through like, you know, 30 minutes of, of, of me ranting about something that doesn't have anything. If you want to watch the rant, great. You can jump to the rant and watch it. Otherwise, I don't want to force you to watch it. So just a note uh, about the book that we're doing. Once again, if you're new, we've been working through this book called uh, Learning Learning Web Design uh, from, uh, what page are we on here so I can catch it? Page 228. So let me show you the first page here. Um, it, it's been inverted. Watch your eyes here and I'll, I'll change the version. This is actually, by the way, this, this is the standard GNOME uh, PDF viewer on Pop! OS. And you can actually turn night mode on and off now. So this is the book. This is uh, uh, Jen Robbins' book. Uh, it's not to be confused with Jen Simmons. Different person. Um, what's going on here? What's going on here? There we go. So this is what the book looks like. Uh, Jen Robbins. This is the standard book for web design and development in colleges and has been for a very long time. Uh, as we've seen over the last, you know, several weeks, it's very outdated, but it still concentrates on things that are very important, uh, particularly from a designer perspective about who you're designing for and stuff. So I've decided to keep it and work through it um, until and if, you know, I can write my own or we can make our own knowledge base about these topics um, that is a little bit more, um, you know, up to date. And they may, who knows, Jen might be actually coming out with a new one at some point. All right, so I'm going to switch back to dark mode and go back to two, page 228. Uh, but this is, a, I've, you know, I've purchased several copies of this book uh, and encouraged, you know, hundreds of other people to purchase copies of the book. So this PDF is one of those that I've got. It is a, you, you should be paying for the book if you download it, uh, but I'm going to let you make that decision. It's up to you. There's a good chance your library has it. 
uh, or your your the company you work for has uh, perhaps has an O'Reilly deal and they can get this you can get it for free. So please make sure you look around before you pay sixty bucks for a book that's you know at least I would say thirty percent out of date. Um, so just just to put that out there. Uh, let's go to page what was it two twenty eight. Uh, 228. I think I can do it here. Nope. Let me see. I might have to go all the way down on my, my own self. I don't, I don't use this tool very much, but we will do this. Go to 228. Well, I guess not. I just have to use page down or something. Why are you not working? <laughs> oh, that's why. There we go. All right, so Canvas. Um, canvas is an HTML thing. And so I'm going to put that in the title right now. It's a topic. Uh, I'm going to say, actually, I'm going to do this again. Uh, and right here, I'm going to put, I don't know how much we're going to be able to do, beginner. And I'm going to put uh, canvas. Okay, so HTML5 canvas. Um, okay, so save that. This is so we have those topical bookmarks like I told you about. Um, so what is canvas about? Well, canvas is how you do all the cool stuff that involves games and stuff. So canvas... Uh, I'm going to read what she says here a little bit. Another cool look mono plugins edition to HTML5 was Canvas. Uh, the Canvas element uh, creates an area on a web page for drawing with a set of JavaScript functions. So Canvas is completely useless to you without JavaScript. And, you know, I've tried to decide whether we should go into Canvas a lot right now or we should just skip over it and wait until we get to, you know, JavaScript where we can do some of that fun stuff. Uh, so mo I think what's more important is to tell you what's possible with Canvas. The Canvas element creates an, an area on a web page for drawing with a set of JavaScript functions. Includes lines, fills, text animations, rasters, which is little, you know, poking little pixels. Uh, you could use it to display an illustration, uh, graphs. Uh, Agario is all Canvas. You know, games. Most games, the Phaser game engine is Canvas. Um, sometimes the Canvas will be laid across the top of with the transparency so that. It looks like snowflakes are falling. I mean, there's just so many things you can do with Canvas. Um, in fact, a really good use of Canvas, uh, just for effects, so I'm going to show you one. Uh, if I can find it. Here we go. If you know about Hack the Box, that is you, right? So this is Canvas. See this here? This is all of this is Canvas. And... Um, I think you can actually inspect and see that it is a canvas. I think. Hack the box image. Okay, yep. I think I think behind the whole thing is a canvas. Let's go see a container. You know, I did that, right? We're going to be doing a lot of that inspect elements stuff as we have been all along. Um, let's go back here. Canvas. I mean, it, my my fan just came on because canvas takes a lot of horsepower so flexbox pretty sure this is a canvas let's go see body yep there it is so there's the canvas wait let's go find another one come on where's the other one where is the other one? One of two. I want to find two of two. How do I do that? I don't do this pretty much. HTML flexbox canvas. Ooh. But where is the canvas? Maybe it's the whole thing is canvas. Who knows? Maybe it's been put in on the whole background. Um. I, I honestly don't know how to go to the next. I, mean, I don't search for HTML on this program. You guys probably know more than I do. Uh, Particle.js. There it is. There's a canvas. 
And the really cool thing about this is that at any moment you can save the canvas and it will save as a JPEG image right at that moment in time of whatever it's looking at. Um, but as you can see, there's, there's a canvas here that has some events tied to it. Like when you click on it, when the mouse leaves it, it does different things. Uh, but canvas is useless unless it has something mapped to it. Um, you can draw things on the fly uh, without using Flash, which of course no one does anymore. It's worth noting a canvas area draws in raster base. That means it's not vectors. It's like, you know, dots. We talked about raster versus vector. We're going to talk about it again when we get to the images. So let's go on. So here's a bunch of examples of how to do uh, canvas stuff. You can make really amazing games. There's people who have made, um, like, you know, sort of like Microsoft Paint, you know, knockoffs and things like that. So you can do that. If you want to resize images, sometimes you can use it for that. Uh, so the element itself has... A width and a height and this is actually really important because this is exactly how many pixels height and width this is the other ones we've talked about you know working around it and something like this, but not this one this one you really really have to have it it's really important that you have it um and you give it an id so you, you have to have the id because you have to be able to do you grab it you know with your javascript when you're doing stuff with it and if you watch our previous uh boost videos on web design you'll see we do that a lot with javascript i can't wait to get to that part actually um the markup is just, you know, it's just basically here is a canvas and here's how big it is. The end, right? Uh, and then you can draw with JavaScript. There's an entire API for that. Uh, there's different books for doing this. We're not going to go into that at all right now. Uh, here's some JavaScript. You can do. If you want to play around with it, with your own canvas element, you can go ahead and do that. Um, we don't have any... I mean, I mean, let me see if I can put one. Let's go get my the site up that we've been working on all week or all this time. And um, let's pull that up. Uh, let's use our serve thing. Uh, press enter. <laughs> that, that was back on the searching I was doing, right? So let me see here. Let's go back to uh, learning web design. Actually, let me check something here. Yeah, I need to get to reset a little bit. Man, we had some fun doing GraphQL queries against GitHub. Uh, that was a good, that was a fun session. All right. Um, one more. All right, so I'm going to CD into learning web design, my the site we've been working on. And I'm going to set my tmux for this area right here using tmux in. Um, uh, tmux in is just, is just tmux with uh, unsetting the tmux variable so I can have tmux inside of a tmux. In case you're wondering, we'll do a whole video series on Tmux if, you ha if there's not one already out there by the time you read this or watch this. Um, so we have this command called serve, which we talked about. There's an entire video about how to make a really you know, bare, bare bones server. Um, and, and you can make that there. Um, and I can put it in the background. Uh, there's another tool, however, that I'm going to use that I'm eventually going to tell you about called uh, Preview, which uses a thing called Browser Sync which I also want to show you about. I'm going to do my own video series just on browser sync. Um, and that it, it's, it's a node tool, so I don't want to confuse the, the point. So we're going to go ahead and um, just start the server. So we'll start the server here. And and then we can start to, uh, you know, if you'll have to go back and watch the other video, but we can go back to localhost uh, 8080. There we go. So there's our good old localhost 8080, our, our marquee that we're playing around with. And there's a bunch of stuff here. We did Linux here. We got Torvalds and everything. Let's inspect element on this so we can work on our canvas element and play around with that. And what? Let's do that. Canvas. Well, let's, let's do a canvas test. So uh, I, I can't probably see this right now, but oopsie, I'm in the wrong window. Let's, let's use a different window. So make a new window. You can be doing this all with VS Code as well or however you want to do it. We, we went into that somewhat. Uh, there's an entire video on picking the right editor for you um, if you want to do it with Vim and, you know, and Linux. That's a, a different choice. Uh, th I, I will pause it for those of you who are just starting at the beginner boost here with me. Um, I, rather than go through how to set up all of Linux before we jumped into web development, we did autodidactic habits, and then we, did, we jumped right into web design uh, with the assumption that you can use whatever editor that you're available with right now. Uh, in other words, I've changed from having a dependency on Linux in the command line before I did web design 
to just jumping right into web design and doing that first so you can get a handle of how to code and stuff and and if you want you know you can actually become acquainted with vs code and then so you can make an informed decision later on when i you know you decide whether you want to do vim and be a terminal jockey like we are uh, or you want to stay with vs code and there's no judgment for me on that if you want to do that i did it for a year uh i i've since moved on but but if you you're back i should say <laughs> to vim uh but so that's just to kind of give you a sense of, of where we are on this um so here we have uh, all this stuff here, and I'm, I'm going to change the transparency. I'm going to do a little trick though here. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to turn transparency uh, down uh, quite a bit because I, but I, because I want to be able to see the changes as they happen. Um, but I think we'll be I think we'll be fine. Uh, all right. So what I can do now is I'm going to just make a directory for Canvas. Uh, you know, and then we'll see the end of the Canvas directory. And we'll make a new direct. We'll make a new file. Let me turn this stuff off down here. Sorry, guys. If you have specific questions, feel free to ask in IRC, and I'll show up on my screen. But do know it'll be saved for time and eternity. <laughs> so, so you know, ask questions wisely. Um, let me see something here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So we're inside the canvas now, are we not? Yes. So let's uh, index the HTML. So every time we do a new page, it's a good refresher. Uh, uh, what did we write the server in? I did a whole video on that. So you can go go watch vids uh, and uh, go server. And um, that should help you find what you want there. Let me go ahead and open that link. So here is, uh, oh, that's a different video. Uh, well, I guess it didn't. Pull it up. Let's try. Go. Nope, that's not it. Go exploring generics. Nope, that's not it. I thought it was. Let's do a search for. Let's search for server, shall we? Server. There it is. Coding a simple web server. Oh, in Go. I didn't put. Whoa. I did. I need to change the. I need to change that. I need to change that title so it has go in the name. <laughs> Somebody downloaded it. <laughs> I love it when people download things. It's like they have nothing better to do with their life. Um, edit video. <laughs> I I have no. I wish that they maintained coding a simple web server and go. Uh, there we go. So. Now let's try let's try that little trick again, and see if it works. So we can go back here. There's no bookmarks, but if you want to write a Go server, you can go look at this. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Five hours, and we'll go get coffee. It doesn't take five hours. I I don't pretend. People are used to like polished, edited content. They come in here and then they download me. Uh, go length for search engines. I know, I hate that. I personally am put off by that, but yeah, well, I'm not the only one. Let's do go server. See if this helps. It must not have been. Uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't think it's been indexed yet. If you search for server, there you go. Code simple web server and go. There you go. Ha! I said go twice. This will tell you how to do the go server. It's written in go and it's it's like 34 lines of code. There's other better ways to make a web server that are more robust, but that is enough to do a preview. And um, so that so that that'll help you out. Um, all right. So we're inside of this canvas. So. Let's go back. What is it that we're actually doing here? Well, uh, I'm going to change my preferences back because I need it. I'm, I, I, I'm gonna, I've changed my mind. I want to see my background. So there. I just want to. I'm going to be here for three hours. I want it to be peaceful and comfortable and happy on my eyes. <laughs> I really don't like that that does down samples every time. All right, so let's do this. Let's do a hey, Lundmar. Uh, again, the topic today is beginner stuff. 
Uh, today is a beginner web server day. Lamar, it, all of my other favorite regulars, this is beginner time. So unless it's about beginner time, please don't say anything. Yeah, you can Python-M, but I hate that. It seems you have Python on the system. It, you can you can also just download your Go serve and then run it. Or you can just write those lines and then run it. So there's a million better ways to do it than Python. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, besides, that doesn't do any updates. It also doesn't give you. It does also doesn't give you control of what's happening on the forum processes, which is what we did. So I mean, we did all that stuff already. I don't want to go into it again. So I, I mean, right now, let me just recap for those of you who want to know what's going on on that. When you go to the the um, this thing here, uh, there's a form, right? Let's go find a form here. Uh, which one was it? Is it distros? I don't remember which page it was. But part of the part of the thing that we did when we write the form was we wrote, wrote a way to reflect back uh, the values in JSON. So I don't remember which one it was. Uh, contact. So you can go to contact, and I guarantee you, your Python won't do this. So you can come in here and put Rob and all this stuff. Clickable links. Uh, you can like change values. Uh, you can make where like color pickers, and and do all this. We did this last time. And you can click on submit and you get the values reflected back to you in JSON so you can test your form processing. No, Python doesn't do that. So that's a reason to do your own thing and it doesn't take the longest, only a few lines. So watch that video if you care to do that, but I had to recap for those who don't know about it. Uh, meanwhile, back on Canvas land, uh, we'll go to Canvas. Nothing there uh, at all. So we're going to do a review of how to make a new web page. And it seems like we do this a lot. And by the way, that's how your memory works is it has to be repeated, right? To keep, keep it in there. You guys know this. Um, so we're going to go in there and we're going to make a thing. Uh, we're going to make an index.html page. I call this the HTML5 challenge. How fast can you make a web page from scratch without using completion from your VS code? What's the first one? Dog type HTML. Might be a good time, time for you to practice. HTML, and you're like, done. I just did tab completion. That eh, doesn't mean you know anything, though. Um, head. Head. Uh, body. Body. I'm going to do this a lot because I want you to get it stuck in your head. Canvas. Haha. Sample title. Uh, uh, we I have to have. Let's do uh, meta char set equals utf. UTF8. You always want to put that because some Nginx doesn't come default to configure to do that. So, um, uh, what else? Uh, link in the style. Oops. Uh, link. Can you do these like from your heart? You know, link rel equals style sheet. I'm not doing my quotes because I don't need it. Uh, I need it on anything that's got funky characters in it. Um, uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, okay. Pork roast is nice. Nice. Now it's saved for time and all eternity in our web development thing to talk about your pork roast, Lundmar. Congratulations. Mm. We're not chitter chattering right now. All right. So link rel style sheet. And then what? We're going to do, oh, href href equals slash assets slash styles css uh and then body will say i guess i could do a main here main h1 is a uh, canvas sample <laughs> uh there's our time not to measure for incorrigible canvas height equals uh 600 width equals uh 800 that's the standard size by the way for ipads and ipod type games so if you make games that that are that size 
if they if they full screen the the canvas, it'll fit perfectly. You won't get any any distortion for for iPads and things like that. There, there's a bunch of extra stuff you have to do to get to get games to properly resize, particularly canvas games, because they actually stretching them stuff like that's bad, right? Because it'll make it look bad because it's a raster image, which means there's a bunch of dots instead of a bunch of you know lines that are mathematically calculated. So, um, and we'll say ID equals sample, uh, and um, uh, I think that's it. Let me try that. Let's go look at refresh and see how I did. Reload. Yay, canvas sample. And um, main canvas. So there, there is the canvas. You see it? Uh, the device with stuff. It's important, but it's not. I don't think that that's mandatory, Jason. Um, I don't. I I do think it's very important, but it's it's. And we're still on beginner content, and that hasn't been covered. So, but the uh, the char the char set is 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 really really standard. Um, yeah, I do think device width at some point is going to become more of a standard personally. Um, but you know, basic. It's 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 hard because there's like so many boilerplate things that you might want to add to your standard configuration, particularly if you're dealing with canvases, right? Because canvases, they they need to do stuff differently, um, and so yeah, uh, I yeah I she doesn't cover any of the standard things to include except for the Charset one, um, which might be a little bit dated because some of that stuff I would think like the one you mentioned is um and viewport right those kind of things i think are these days are considered standard um but we haven't we haven't covered them and this of course is just a minimal coverage of of what's in the book and then and i'm trying to to, to follow that <laughs> we'll go we'll go from there and try to add in some of the other stuff in case you're wondering if you're just a beginner and you wonder what that's all about having standard boilerplate what does boilerplate mean okay so Boilerplate is when you have a template that you're going to reuse all the time that is pretty much, you know, you start with it and then you build on top of that. Um, and in fact, there's been lots of boilerplate over the years. Um, I'm going to change the topic to talk about boilerplate for a bit. Um, the project set a video. Thanks. Um, so let's do this. So let's do this. Let's say um, I'm going to change the topic briefly to talk about boilerplate. Uh, what is um, boilerplate? Okay, so uh, because he, he he somebody okay so when we're talking about boilerplate boilerplate the question came up well what about this should you put this we were dealing with canvas which we're going to return to um, and and I added meta char set UTF eight as like you should pretty much always have that just as a matter of fact you should also have Lang is pretty important, right? You should also have Lang equals ing, uh, en dash us. So, and this is a good example of boilerplate. So boilerplate is like a template, yeah. Uh, but the topic in boilerplate, um, which I think the term boilerplate, let's go look. Uh, what does uh, what does boilerplate mean? And I think it goes back to printing, if I remember right. English, uh, U.S. phrases, let's see, say something, that's not it, uh, slang for provisions in a contract form or legal pleading, which are apparently routine and often pre-printed, and the term comes from an old method of printing, uh, today boilerplate is commonly stored in computer memory to be retrieved and copied when needed, so it's like a template, a template is probably the better thing to say, but people still say boilerplate, in fact, I'll show it to you. So one of the, the, this is kind of dated now, but HTML5 boilerplate uh, has been popular for years. Um, and what it is, is it's the world's most popular front end template. So if you wanted to start with a web page and just have it be the right thing, and this is kind of dated, and this brings us to the question about, well, you know, what's the best boilerplate to have, right? So this is here, the web's most popular. HTML boilerplate builds fast, robust, and adaptable websites, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it gives you, you know, it normalizes your styles, but this is pretty dated actually. Um, in fact, I, I would love to see when this actually is came out. Uh, they want to leave template on for front end exclusively, probably who knows. Um, so this, 
this says it was last modified December 2020, which is pretty recent. Um, so maybe it's not too out of date, but, and let's open that up in a web browser, like a graphic web browser. So here you go, HTML5 boilerplate.com. So if you're wondering, well, how should I get started, right? And I wanna, if it, it is, there's a little bit of a fear when you first start out, because you don't, you know, you can't just use the simple stuff I've told you. You know that in the final version, you should probably use a few more things like, you know, viewport and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. And if you, if you go to, um, like, what are you guys saying? You're saying some more stuff here. I miss it. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, it's like, there's a version eight. Uh, you can go look at the source code and check it out. This is GitHub. We haven't talked about GitHub, but you should have it. Um, and what is it about? Well, I mean, it's all this stuff just to say, well, what should be in my standard first version? How should I organize my code? And I don't want you to feel like you should follow somebody else's directives for this. You can be your own person and make your stuff under assets, you know, and, and stuff like that. You don't have to follow uh, and use modernizer and all these different things that they do. And But this does give you a sense of files that you might forget about, like humans.txt and, and favicon, you know. These are things that we've seen that are not discussed in the web in the book, but they kind of are needed. So, this conversation, this sort of side conversation, is is about boilerplate and where you can find it. Um, and yeah, this boilerplate. There's you you. There are lots of ideas about what should be in a standard. You know, and and that's a mention the fact. This is all all markdown. Um, so. You know, that, I guess that's just a documentation to be tell you truthful. So I, if you're if you're hosting on like something like Netlify, you might want to have a 404 error message, um, and 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 such. And they didn't put everything under assets; they put it under JavaScript and IMG. Uh, uh, yeah, and this gets you know a little crazy. But and then here's their here's their very basic boilerplate for index.html. In their world, this is what should be in every single index.html page. You should have a description, you should have a viewport, and that's what I talked about earlier uh, with the device width. Uh, you should have these aug things. This is what makes it uh, work. Uh, these are properties that, that help it work with um, you know things like Twitter and stuff. There's actually, I think they're missing stuff. I, I think you should probably, if you want a true boilerplate, you should, there's the meta that I mentioned. Uh, they have class no JS, so that's interesting. They have language stuff there. Um, they did they they left out um, some of the the card stuff that you might want so that web pages look pretty. Um, but the aug is the minimum to have in there. Um, they have normalized. They have style sheets for normalizing. They put the CS under here. I don't. I think you should put it under assets, but that's me, just me. Um, they have that theme color content. I didn't know about that. Theme color. That's a new one. I haven't seen that one before. I have to look, study that one. Uh, add your site or application. Blah blah blah. And the modernizer is just a way of keeping your JavaScript up to date, and that normalizes keeping your CSS all, you know, synchronized across browsers. So these are advanced techniques. And then of course they have the Google Analytics, as if putting Google Analytics is a standard thing that every single website should have, which I strongly disagree with. The fact that this is in a standard boilerplate should that just angers me i don't need having google analytics in everything by standard is not a requirement theme colors when you launch the website as an app as a progressive app nice thanks for the fill in there uh, for a web beginner boost or should i start from the beginning uh if you're if you're going to do the web beginner boost my idea of starting is going through this book uh, as lengthy as that is um, and you can skip through that skips through this all, all you want uh, There's a lot of other people that are professionally employed in web development every day all the time and they probably are better sources for For really, you know solid front-end web development I won't claim to be the authority on that even though I was you know Nike's internet webmaster and I learned HTML before 99.999% of the population even knew it existed <laughs> back when I was working at Teleport, but all of that being said 
I'm, I don't deal with it every day and I'm going to go through the book and I'm going to tell you the minimum you need to know to be able to work through it. Um, uh, it's no surprise to anyone watching this that when you go through the beginner boosts, my boosts are, are, have a, a slant. My slant is on sort of back end things, but you have to have a front end knowledge as well in order to hack it or in order to produce it for whatever purpose that you need. So you need to know HTML and CSS and going through that book is the best way to do that for me. Uh, uh, yeah, if you already know the basics of the CSS and HTML, you don't need to go through that. Uh, we'll be doing uh, the basics of JavaScript as well as when we, uh, when we in a couple of booths after this. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to put that out there. That's the end of the boilerplate conversation. Uh, HTML, I hope they become trending. Me too. Uh, I think the simple HTML websites are starting to trend. I think the fact that Svelte is, is, has took over from React as the most popular framework last year, that's true fact. You go do the research on that yourself. Uh, Svelte took over for React. It's the number one. Uh, yeah. And even, uh, yeah, go read it. It's really crazy. Yeah, it's like, it was in, it was, uh, go read it. Go go read the from the Svelte. Go, go read the Svelte thing. Yeah, we're not going to talk about that right now, but go read about it. There's definitely stuff on that. Uh, Barry HTML is a little less CSS as possible. And I, me too, I don't want to use... A bunch of extra stuff if it's unnecessary and i i am in that camp so and i think so is um so is jen while she's doing this book but i just wanted to make you aware of boilerplate so let's get back to the topic at hand um so the topic we're still working on is canvas um so let me see i'll go back to canvas uh html5 canvas uh and uh and no bootstrap. You don't need bootstrap anymore. You can see CSS grid. So I'm just adding this. I'm putting the topic back so people know what we're working on again. And uh, so that that question was spawned from the boilerplate thing. So we're back, back to where we need to be here. Uh, and here's a canvas sample. So as you can see, the canvas is, is just empty. There's nothing on it. It's, it's like 800 bit 600. You can actually store the picture up there. We're going to play around with a little bit of JavaScript just to show you how it populates it, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because, you know, we got to move on to other stuff. So the book says that we can type in some, we're going to do some, even some, in, we don't even need inline JavaScript. We can put the JavaScript in our little script that we made already. Um, and she's just adding an event listener so that when the page adds uh, run canvas app, um, I don't think you need that anymore, but we'll see. So we can actually just run a function. Let's try that. So canvas app, uh, that's a pretty big freaking canvas app. I don't want to do that. <laughs> if you want to type that in, you can, but we're going to start simple. We're just going to draw a few things on that, on the canvas. And let's do that from, from here. Actually, let's go to the console. And we can actually cheat and just go straight to it. Uh, so first of all, we need to get a reference to the canvas. Remember that? So we're going to let uh, my canvas equal um, get uh, document dot get element. You can do get element by D or, or query selector. You don't know about those yet. but And what do we call it? We call it, I think we called it canvas. Right? No, we called it sample. Uh, all right, so sample. There, so sample is now we have, we've selected, we've put a reference to our canvas into this thing. And you can see all the cool things you can mess with on here. Uh, uh, oh, well, that's funny. Look at that, it's doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's saying all this deprecated stuff because we're using Firefox. I remember before I told you that this doing this kind of stuff on the console is your single best way to learn about this stuff. Because you can go in here and experiment and say, well, what does this do? Well, what if I change this? Well, what if I change this, right? So let's um, immediately, let's like already change a thing. Let's say, uh, well, we have a handle on the canvas, basic URID, column count. Uh, first child, inner HTML, inner text. So we don't need any of that. You can put stuff in there, but you don't need to. 
let's see let's do i mean there's like all these events that we can map to um and there's our height and width there's a regular one um we could change the background if we wanted to uh you know you know how to change that right so um actually no let's let's do this let's make it so i keep using the vi commands on here i i do all the time i do my vi commands and i get screwed up um So I want to let mm, sample there, and then I can do that. So now I can do sample. All right. So it's sample dot. We could change the background. So let's do that. Let's sample dot. Is it um, uh, style style dot background uh, equals black there you go so you can change it you can change it just from running stuff uh there let me check what do you guys say you guys saying anything interesting a triangle or a circle instead of a silly smiley yeah we'll do something like that um let's just get a line to draw how about that so let's go back to the book on that so my canvas stroke a rectangle. So let's make a rectangle. Get context 2D. Oh, I forgot. You got to do that. So you can do context 2D or 3D. If you use 3D, uh, you get acceleration from your GPU. If you use 2D, you don't. So and they may have changed that, but it's it's really important if you're doing phaser games to do the 3D, even if you're doing 2D games, because you get GPU acceleration. Otherwise, it's, it's really slow. So we're going to do stroke rect let's try this uh and see what how, how big of a, a size we have so let's say so sample dot stroke um is it rect i mean you have to look at these every time i have to look them all up so rect and then we'll do zero let's do like 10 comma 10 comma 60 comma 60. what is it not a function anymore did they change it oh wait i have to do canvas I have to get I have to get context. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, so oh, I I don't think I knew that because I phaser does it for me all the time. So yeah, so actually, what we can do here is we can do we can do let my canvas equal that thing, and then we can do uh, canvas wait sample sample equals uh, canvas get context. Okay, so. That would be my canvas dot get context right context two D two D two D context. Um, let's see if that works. My canvas is null. Why is my canvas null? Do do shouldn't be. Oh wait. My canvas equals get element by the sample. Oh wait, wait, we can't do that because we already let we already did a let, so I have to change it. There we go. And and then we can do sample. We already did that. Now get 2D context. Uh, all right, so now I have this thing I can draw on. So let's do the rect, stroke rect thing. Um, stroke rect, where are you? Nope, now I can do context 2D. Well, let's do it. Sample dot stroke rect. Now I know I'm doing the right thing because I got completion and all that, right? Uh, stroke rect, and then we'll do like 10, whoops. And 10 comma 80 comma 80, and it returned it undefined because why? Maybe it was because the background was black already. Let's try that. My canvas dot style dot background uh, equals cyan. There we go. So so you see, we just drew on there. I didn't do anything fancy. What I did want to show you though is that when you right draw on a canvas, you can right click, so you can make really fun tools for people who want to like you know draw. Um, 
like it's relatively easy to make a function that just draws at that specific point and you can just like scroll around on the screen in fact it's, it's almost worth doing right now i'm really tempted to do that because <laughs> all you have to do is just make it draw wherever your wherever your um uh your 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 fingers are wherever you're you know you can have it draw pictures too on that specific spot uh, let me see fill style black fill text to low canvas um i'm trying to find i mean but you can look it up i i can't remember it but there's one where you can like draw circles everywhere actually let's do this let's do rectangles everywhere shall we so if you click on it if you click on the thing, uh, we need, we're going to get an event. We need to do a, a mouse click event and I don't remember how to do them, but we're going to try. So my sample, uh, let's see, mouse move to mouse textile. No, nope. we need to, we need to do clicks. So we need to put an event in here and well, I, yeah. Is it on click? Well, I, I I know about on click, but um, so let's do let's do this on click equals for right now. Let's do this. Let's do uh, my canvas dot on click uh, equals, and we'll just have uh, an event, and we'll say I I, I just want to console log the event. You guys haven't learned how to do this yet, so that's that's a that's a function. We're writing a function to handle every time we click. Spelling con click. <laughs> that's not gonna work. Alright, so every time we click, and uh, we haven't done events yet with JavaScript, but with using a canvas, it's pretty much useless without an event. So as you can see, it's it's giving us a bunch of information every time we click. We can go look at this information. I don't even know what it is. I'm going to just go look it up. So it gives us the client XY. Uh, it tells you what was clicked, um, the current target. Ooh, look at this explicit explicit origin original target. Ooh, okay. So explicit original target. That means it's like this is the thing that got clicked on. And here it is, and and you can you can do things to it. Uh, you can check the client height. I mean, we could probably. What I'm trying to do is just like make it make a. a I've never done this before, but if you can make it make a make a dot in the middle of it. And I've seen people do this where you like you just click and you can make like little rectangles appear everywhere. Um, so we could do. Let's see. Original offset height, offset parent, offset top. Ooh, see this is important. Offset width 800, offset top. Wait, let's try this again. So I think that offset is actually a really good thing because the offset tells how far in it was clicked, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, there's like entire tutorials about how to do this. Then we, let's go look at the book and see if she has some stuff in already. Um, again, that's the goal is just working through the book. But if you don't want to just do a static thing, it's much more fun to use a canvas when you're interacting with the events that you're generating from uh, from here, but you aren't ready for that yet, to tell you the truth, because you don't know about events and you don't even you're not even supposed to know about JavaScript really. So we will come back to it. I promise. We'll get back to it, so you can click on things and, and make things appear. But I did want to spend some time on the canvas. You can make your own game just using Canvas, just like this. And we are going to make that game when we work through a book called Eloquent JavaScript. And I am probably going to work through eloquent javascript instead of uh js way i might do both uh because this has uh, an entire project that just draws on the canvas as part of learning javascript and this is a free book you can you can download it as a pdf or whatever and it was it was crowdfunded it's really good uh, some people would say it's it's a little bit too deep uh and and the js way is uh, a really good one as well. Um, I don't know where it is. JS way. Hopefully I can find it. The JavaScript way from GitHub. Uh, and uh, this is actually also a really good book. Uh, it, except for it's it's a little bit, you know, Baptiste has done a good job at this. The problem with it is that it's a little bit too 
uh, absent on on the um, exercises and stuff. So, you know, I if 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 there's those of you among us who want to go jumping down the JavaScript path right now, uh, yes, the Eloquent JavaScript book is the number one. Uh, I still recommend, but the JavaScript way is really close second. JavaScript way is simpler than than Eloquent JavaScript, but most of the people watching this are going to be okay with Eloquent JavaScript. And since we talked about canvases, I just want to show that there is an entire section in here about how to make a game with a canvas using the canvas element. And here you can see they did the same thing we just did, fill style, just like we did, and lines and surfaces. And I'm going to jump ahead to the game that they make. The reason that I love the game that they make in Eloquent JavaScript is because they don't they don't assume that you have an engine like, you know, Pixie or Phaser or, you know, any any of the ones that are out there. Um, you can just, you know, do your own. And I love that. I love that. That shows that you can you can do your own thing. Um, so if you want to go play around with Canvas, now you know what to do. And there it is. If you want to go deep dive into that right now, um, checking for comments. Uh, let me check the let me check Twitch and YouTube for comments. Um, you love the Golang project. Thank you. Uh, uh, let's say I think I find your website. You can chit chat. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you. Learn go. Thank you. Learn go very much. Um, I'll have to send people out to your stuff too. Um, and what do we got here? Ninety five sure. I think the new recommendation to put GA in the head. Uh, really? Hmm. Now, that's interesting, Angry the Moose. Angry Moose, uh, you're, you're, mentioning, you're in the IRC now too, right? Theme caller, you guys have commented very much in the IRC. Thank you. Uh, okay, so it looks like we've covered all the comments. Appreciate that. And I'm going to go back to the book for a bit. Um, and uh, we're going to go through that. Um, in fact, why don't I go ahead and... Let me go ahead and, and clear out the chat just so I don't think something's there. All right, uh, we're going to make it through Canvas, and we'll do a time check here. This is the kind of thing that you're just going to have a blast playing with it. I don't feel like we need to do it right now. I think you should do it on your own and then let us know, like report back in, like in our community and let people know, do our show and tell on the Discord or whatever, and show people the things that you've made just with Canvas by itself. Um, and there's a test for the rest of that, the end of that chapter. We did a lot uh, in this last section. We only covered Canvas so far today, but we covered audio, we covered embeds, we covered iframes, which is how you embed YouTube videos. Um, you know, we did all of it and just know it's there. Uh, I don't feel like you need to, to, to memorize this. If you feel like you do to pass some sort of test somewhere, then just do a lot of it. You know, the best way to do that is to make something and then write the whole thing again and write it again and write it again and just keep committing it to memory that way. If you if you want to have all of this information like right at your fingertips ready to use, um, as I've said before, most technology doesn't happen that way. People don't have this kind of this amount of data at their fingertips ready to use. They almost always have to look it up. It's more important that you learn how to search quickly than it is for you to l literally commit everything to memory. Not to mention the fact that half of it's going to be deprecated in two years anyway, and all that memory is going to be wasted. So it's more important that you know how to search stuff up and mess around with it and figure out how it works than it is to memorize this. But some things are worth memorizing. Um, so I'll let that let you decide what those things are. Um, we talked about videos, I and we talked about MP4 versus, you know, AUG and all of that. Um, I'm not going to rehash that. And we are off and running uh, to CSS. I am going to take a very short break, and uh, as I as I tend to do, and just catch my breath. And um, we'll come back and we'll jump into CSS. CSS is by far the thickest section of this entire book. And that's because the book is titled Learning Web Design. And Jen very clearly is a web designer. Uh, the, the quote from Jen, the other Jen from Mozilla on the homepage, is from one of the core team members of the CSS project. So uh, this is really, really heavy on CSS. And um, that's actually one of the reasons I want to go through it. Um, uh, unfortunately, my knowledge of CSS is... CSS is one of those things that is really moving fast as well. My personal knowledge of CSS is only what's in the browser and, and what I've learned that way. And I've 
you know, I, I know enough CSS to get by, but there's a lot. We're going to talk about CSS a lot. I don't want to, I don't want to give too much away right now, but, but as soon before we get into CSS really deeply, we're going to, we're going to have a little discussion about, about whether you should use CSS at all, uh, or you should use a CSS framework like Tailwinds or any of these other things that are out there. Uh, and we're going to start with that. So a lot of people would end with that. I want to start with that because uh, a, lot of a lot of people out there that are watching this are going to be wanting to make a decision about whether they should even learn, you know, an extensive list of, of CSS. Uh, there are some minimal things that I really think you need to learn, such as, um, you know, responsive web design techniques, uh, CSS grid, uh, which I recently just used to redo rwxrob.live, uh, Flexbox, and these are all modern things that are covered in here. That's kind of nice to know. Um, and then we'll we'll decide how to go for that. So I'm going to mark myself as on break for a bit. And um, so I'm just going to put AFK, uh, let me say, away until uh, 11, 1130. When I come back, we'll be doing CSS. Imagine it default site. We will actually play around with that. Um, we will. We can turn it off. It's actually kind of fun. All right, see you in a bit.
All right. So, uh, one of the fun things we can do in a live session like this, live community stream, is we can have a little bit of a debate, uh, you know, kind of a dialogue. CSS3, of course, yeah. And, and let's talk about what that means. So, again, if you're, if you're just joining us, um, uh, you can go to chat.artibix.gg if you want to participate in the chat on the screen. Um, I will try to read the YouTube and the, and the uh, Twitch chat as well, but um, in, in general, I don't always look at that. Um, and just so you know. And um, so the question really is, in the face of technologies like Tailwind, should we use CSS? Well, let's first of all talk about what CSS really briefly so we can have a conversation about that. And we'll let Jen tell that story for us. So in her book, she says, um, CSS for presentation. So again, CSS is the style. It's the HTML is the structure. It's the you know it's it's the content. CSS is the appearance and the style. And they were separated out some time ago, uh, and you know really refined with CSS three, which was a part of HTML five, etc. Introducing the cascading style sheets. Um, we're going to learn about the power of CSS, how markup creates document structure, uh, and we're going to write some CSS rules, some style rules, attach styles to the HTML document, and then, and we've already been doing a lot of this, uh, which another another critique I have of the book is that she does all of this stuff in advance and then doesn't talk about it really, just says, hey, we're going to learn about it later, just do this for now. And I would have rather to have two cycles. I would have had to, a minimum cycle on, you know, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and then revisit all of them and then go into them deeper so that you're not just getting thrown into stuff you've never seen before. Um, you've heard style sheets mentioned quite a bit, uh, and now we'll finally put them to work. <laughs> so that's my point. You, you know, okay. So their presentation uh css is its own language and this is a sort of a really important point here um css is another language people people uh, beat themselves up because they're learning web design or web development um and or they put down web developers and i would be among them sometimes i'm pretty harsh on web developers I'm like oh you know you're not a real developer if you're a web developer <laughs> there's kind of a there's kind of a feeling among you know back in system administrators and system engineers and stuff that Web development front end people are less than you know true engineers, and it's, it's not true. I mean, it's it's definitely has anything nothing to do with intelligence. Uh, culturally, I will admit that um, you know I've 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 had several run-ins with with front end engineers who think that the whole world uh, revolves around the front end and that that's the only thing we should be using. Blah blah blah, and that's also not good. Um, and that's going to come back into our conversation here in a bit when we talk about how to deal with CSS and whether we should have it and all that. The benefits of CSS, uh, if you need further convincing, you need a precise control over thing, uh, less work to edit the entire site and once, uh, this, this is actually a very, a very dated comment right here. Uh, you can change the appearance of the entire site by editing one sheet. Uh, that is the traditional approach to CSS and HTML. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about uh, that a lot, in fact, one of the reasons I think that that it's that this particular book is going to have a hard time being republished in this current form is because the entire approach uh, to web development has changed, um, and it's largely it might be returning to that. That's what some of the conversation was about. And I'm going to turn the chat up just to see what you guys have to say about this. But um, I mean, at one point, I mean, people you make CSS for every web page people create. Uh, no, they don't. Uh, but what they do do more now than ever is they use something called component component oriented design, where they combine CSS, uh, JavaScript, and HTML into a component, and then those components are placed together. They're composed together, and that's what uh, React does. That's what Vue does. Um, and that the idea is that it's easier to manage a, an application by looking at its individual components than it is uh, to look at the whole entire application as a single component, as a single, as a thing, single thing. And and I, I I haven't done any of this professionally. I've just messed around with Vue on my own and some stuff. Uh, I'm a little bit playing around with React. And 
I'm really curious to see what Svelte JS brings to the table. These are all JavaScript frameworks that kind of aspire to help us with these kind of questions. And but that so so when Jen says here you can change the appearance of the entire site by changing one style sheet, that's a very '90s way of looking at. How's it going? Hey, all right, good to see you. Um, and and um, you know, I so this is a big question. So the question before us is, uh, is do yeah the component oriented design and you can actually read about it. Let me go do a search for you. Uh, what is component? And as usual, the front end world decides to name things that the rest of us should just use. <laughs> uh, they like took over the term API. Everybody thinks you mean web API when in fact it's just an API. It doesn't mean web specific anything. Uh, uh, you know, they tried to take over the term node, which is like a fundamental term from graph theory. <laughs> it's just, I, 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 I just have a lot of reasons to resent the front end community because of their, the hubris. They just, they think they're God's gift to the world. Uh, you know, it's like, what is, what is component oriented design? Uh, so component oriented design, uh, actually I'm going to, I'm going to do a I'm going to do topic change right here real quick. Um, uh, what is component or oriented design? Yeah, a lot of people do. Component oriented. I'm not trying to put you down if you're a front end person. Okay, I just it's just been my experience. Uh, design and why is it important? Um, so I'm going to change the topic really quick. So we can actually do a search for that uh, here and go find some stuff. And this is going to play into our conversation about CSS before we even get into the CSS conversation. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, why does component component oriented programming mean or component oriented design? A component architecture is compatible with object oriented. Um, C sharp is both component and O. A component architecture has the following important parts. All right. So let's go. Read is stupid. I do not like Cora because I can't read it here. Cora, you're an idiot. Your designers, your web designers, are stupid morons who don't know how to do progressive web design, which means that you support all browsers, not only browsers that have JavaScript enabled. You're a freaking documentation site. You need to do the right thing and start supporting things that don't have JavaScript. Okay, there. Um, here we go, right here. What does component-oriented uh, programming mean? Why is C-sharp component-oriented, not object-oriented programming? Uh, this is a rough, this is a, looks like late binding. I mean, all this blah, blah, blah. I don't know if we need to send you through all that. Uh, C-sharp does have some component-oriented programming, but you usually hear about component-oriented design, component-oriented design when you're talking about things like React. Um, I, I <laughs> Dude, this is how this is what I'm talking about. He, if you can justify a site that returns this in links, that is nothing but questions and answers. That's the shade. Let's see if we can find something that's better than that. Uh, all right, so uh, okay, you know, I hope they die. I hope Cora dies a horrible freaking death because they're a piece of crap website that nobody should use, that thinks it's an application, and really it's just a big documentation site. I hope they go bankrupt, and I hope somebody else picks up all their business who has true progressive the principles at, at heart and cares about blind people, for example. Uh, all right, so let's go back here. So this is Stack Overflow, another one that at least you can read. Uh, so this has component-oriented programming in Java. Uh, I, that's not where I usually hear about it, though. Uh, so let's look at this one. Says this is a department of uh, this is Austin, Texas. Um, Got to track users hard. Hey, I don't care if you track users. Tracking users is fine. I, I, I don't like it, right? But you don't you don't make it so that your site does not show without JavaScript. Yeah, if, if your site doesn't even show, doesn't even render without JavaScript, you are doing it wrong. You're like doing it textbook wrong. You're, you're like, you should be fired. That's how bad it is. 
you, and if you're not going to get fired, you're going to get sued like Pizza Hut. You're going to lose like Pizza Hut. You're going to pay millions of dollars, and you you are going to be responsible for a loss of millions of dollars from from customers and from lawsuits from people for, because it's against the law for you to do that. If you are a corporation, if you're doing websites for a corporation, and you should do that. I fire you on the spot. And the fact that people have built entire business models off of this just absolutely astounds me. Uh, okay, so. Uh, Okay, well, we're we're doing web design right now, Hikari, so I can't can't really talk about that right now. Uh, does doesn't anyone use JavaScript today? Everyone, you mean? No, absolutely not. And it's extremely insecure, and it's it's against the tr the concepts of progressive design to force your users to have to have JavaScript enabled to view your content, your questions and answers site. Well, the worst, yeah. So, anyway. Let's read this question and see we get. What is component-oriented programming and how is it different from OOP? And why does it matter to CSS? We're in the CSS section now. So why does this matter? Well, this is going to matter because we're going to talk about a bunch of tools for combining styles with HTML. And we already alluded to them earlier, so I kind of want to talk about them. Uh, JS's true role is, we already talked about this. JavaScript is there to make an application web or, you, or to mess with the data and the events. It's a supplement. JavaScript is a supplement. It's a progressive enhancement to an existing something. If you, if you have an application, then JavaScript is fine. If you're dealing with a document, then JavaScript has no place in that except for as a secondary thing, maybe to create a graph that illustrates something that's already, co that's already well covered in tables. But if you make your entire site, and there are blogs that you can't read without JavaScript. If you can't read your blog without JavaScript, you're doing it wrong. Um, uh, there are component web design where it's just CSS plus HTML plus JavaScript. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. So these details of clarity. This is a bad one. Let's see. Uh, Component-based software. Let's go read the Wikipedia on this. I'm doing the searches on purpose with you because I want to feel kind of organic. Um, live updates. Yeah, live updates. If they're doing live updates, that's fine, but they need to make a version that doesn't require live updates. Yep. Yeah. Like none of that stuff on Core is ever going to get saved on, on, on Web Archive. It's stupid, 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 stupid. All right. Component-oriented software... Uh, is a branch of software engineering that emphasizes separation of concerns with respect to the wide ranging functionality available through a system. So things are separated out. It is a reuse it is a reuse based approach of defining, implementing, and composing loosely coupled independent components into systems. So there's a bunch of things in the system and they're loosely coupled together. It's not like object oriented programming where it's usually hierarchical and inherited, although even that's gone away. I think I think actually component oriented design is is the new popular word for object-oriented design where you only use interfaces and you bring things together. Um, uh, how does this apply to CSS? Well, if you're if you're in kind of a component way, you make a component and it has HTML, CSS, and JavaScript combined together, and then those components interact with each other, uh, as opposed to looking at your entire application as uh, you know your whole site, let's say your whole website as HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, software engineering practitioners regard components as a part of the starting platform for service orientation. Components play this role, for example, in web services, service-oriented architectures, uh, and to me, ASAP. <laughs> um, whereby a component is converted by the web service into a service and subsequently inherits further characteristics beyond that of an ordinary component. Components can produce or consume events and can be used for event-driven architectures. All right, and I cannot overstate the supremacy of event-driven architecture. Uh, it is overwhelming in the industry right now, and I really like that because it's consistent with how our real world works more than anything else. Our entire world can be divided up into events and actions. I, I mean, actions, which are events, and objects, or, or I don't like calling them objects. Sometimes I'll call them things or items, but you know, you can go at the, to the lowest level, you can go down to the molecular level, it all boils down to things and what those things do. And when those things do something, when they do something, that's an event. And an event is an instance of a thing doing something. And, and you know, an interaction between two things, usually, um, 
everything is based on this. GitHub Actions, Amazon Lambdas, uh, you know, all of the game development stuff we do is all based on when this happens, then do this, as opposed to if then. And we haven't, we're going to talk a lot about this when we get into, like, you know, um, to actual coding in JavaScript and, and, and in Go and other languages like this. But this of idea of event-driven architectures that are being driven by the interactions of components, not necessarily objects, is, is important. And so an individual software component is a software package, web service, or web resource. Um, uh, this is kind of a different definition than I was going for, but the idea is, is that, is that you, you bundle up all this stuff together and then it talks to other things. And, but I don't want you to think of it as it's an, it's an, it's a fruit and there's an orange and then there's like a mandarin. That idea has overwhelmingly proven to not work. And if, and if, if you need more, um, proof of this, just look at genus phylum, you know, the biology world, look at all of the exceptions to this hierarchical system that they made to try to capture every single creature on planet earth. And how many exceptions to the platypus comes to mind they've had to make to this hierarchical system because that is not how nature works. Nature doesn't work in a nice, pretty hierarchy. Nature mashes up stuff. It mashes components up and makes them work together. And it does it constantly. Our DNA is full of virus DNA because we have been so mashed up with other things over the years. Um, so let's go back. Um, let's get this bring, bring us back to CSS. So. I was hoping to find a, a more succinct explanation of componentary design with regard to web, um, but it doesn't look like we're going to find one. So, uh, uh, React, we're not going to talk about React. We're just going to talk about, um, let's go back to CSS. Uh, let's go back to set the topic back to this. All right, so what is CSS? We talked about CSS being the styles. It's, it's generally one style sheet, and we already did one here. Uh, you know, we, we've been using this all along, uh, and you know, you have this. This is a separate language which we're going to go into right now, and and it's a way of applying specific styles to anything that matches the selector. And this approach is very separate, right? It's like all of the different possible styles are here and in one or two files, and then you have your HTML all in its own files, right? And, and then, you know, JavaScript in some other file. We're in a component already designed to combine the two. But I really want to muddy the waters even further now and tell you another thing that people are doing. And this could get really confusing if you're a beginner, but I feel like we need to somewhat confuse you so you can see. When I've been doing this this whole series. I don't want you to get blindsided by not even knowing about a thing. So if you start to say, oh, I'm doing, you know, learning web design on my own and stuff, and, yeah, we're doing CS now. Like, oh, have you heard about Tailwind? That's like the first thing that's going to come out of somebody's mouth because, and, and you want to say, well, yeah, I've heard of it. I'm studying it. I haven't really played around with it, but I understand what it does, right? It's, I call that a level one or two on the skill stack range between one and 10, 10 being you invented the thing. Um, so let's do this. So let's do, let's search for Tailwind actually. And we can talk about that. Uh, I, first of all, I have mixed feelings on Tailwind yet. I haven't really been able to, to, to buy into it. We are certainly not going to be doing any Tailwind as a beginner because you have to have a full build system to use it. And and we don't do that. <laughs> we just edit things in files and push the files up. We don't make an entire build system. We're not, you know, writing C code that has to be compiled. You know, a lot of people would like to believe that all web pages and websites must be compiled just like C. They call it transpiling and Frankly, these days, that's kind of what you have to learn if you want to be a front-end engineer. Uh, but you need to learn how to do the basics first. So don't get worried with what I'm about to show you. It's going to be very overwhelming. And the whole point I'm showing it, of me showing it to you is so you can know what it is. And, and you can kind of feel like you're you know, ready to talk about it. So let's do that. Let's do... Um, so let's search for Tailwind. And... and um, there we go. Okay, so here's our tailwind.css. Um, if I remember right, there's some pretty, it's, it's safe for, for, well, it's not actually tag Nevit. Oh, well. So, so here we go. Rapidly build modern websites without ever leaving your HTML. Can you tell why we're talking about it right now? Right? 
So there are a lot of professional web front end developers right now that, are, that will tell you, you don't even need CSS. I mean, that's how far some of them will go. If you, if you do this, you don't need it. And the idea is this, that and it's pretty compelling watching how they do it. They actually change elements of the class using a language. It's basically a language of classes. So we briefly, we haven't even really got into class what classes are, but they use these class names as uh, Material UI uh, due to Google's design principles. But tell one is good, yeah. Uh, well, Material UI doesn't have this as well, I don't think, does it? It might have it, right. I mean, but the, the idea, so I'm glad you brought that up, Heatwave, because um, there are, Material UI, I think, is another one, right? In fact, let me go pull, pull that up. Let me pull up Material UI. I, have, I haven't studied Material UI as much. Is it is it a css -y kind of thing? Oh, it's a React UI framework. Well, hell no, I'm not using that. Um, so, okay, so the difference between this, right off the bat, let's just say this. Uh, this looks like it has to be, you have to have React to use it. If you have to have React to use it, then you're using React. You're not using uh, a CSS framework. You're using a CSS something or other that, that, is, that uses React. Uh, but it's generally, it's a general CSS library. Well, I, I mean, the, front, the first thing it says is it says a popular React framework. So is it not a React framework? <laughs> I mean, that's what their own site says. So, yeah, I get a little triggered by all this front-end stuff. Because, yeah, uh, React components are faster and easier web development. Build your own web design uh, and start with material design. Uh, you know, and here's how you do it. You include the font, material UI core. I think this is just look and feel of your components, right? And then here's the themes that they have. So this is, um, okay, so I, we didn't really need to make a distinction here. So this kind of thing has gone all the way into applications to applications design. Uh, and that has nothing to do, it, CSS is a way of theming the application components. And that's what this is, by the way. There's, see all these, there's a whole bunch of different components that you can pick and choose from and put together in your web app and, and have it be awesome. And, and that's fine if you have a web app, you know, there's some really cool web apps out there. But we're just talking about CSS right now. So let's do material CSS. Let's look at that is, shall we? Uh, I love that we have a community to help us out here. Materialize CSS.com. Um, a modern responsive front end framework based on material design. So uh, a material design, in case you're wondering, is this, this, this design idea from Google that pretty much Android's UI, if you've seen it, and they just wanted to standardize it all over the world. And it's gotten really, really popular, and, which is a good thing and a bad thing. I think it's primarily a good thing because that means that that nobody has to care what a native UI looks like anymore. It just is, all looks like material. And, and so you can have applications that otherwise would look you know, gimmicky, like in the old days, you could use a GTK application, which is a, a, a widget framework, and it, you could tell it was a GTK application. Whereas nowadays, if you use GTK with material, which is just, all material is, is a design specification about how things should look and what colors they should use and how things should go together. Uh, it's a very broad, you know, uh, specification. So you can, you know, there's a lot of wiggle room inside of there about how you use it. Um, how's it going, Q Macro? Uh, and, uh, so, so you can go ahead and you can see, uh, what's going on in, in material, in material here. And these sorts of frameworks and design systems are really going to, you know, you're going to see them a lot. That's why I'm telling you about it as a beginner, because you're going to hear, oh, you're learning CSS. Oh, do you know about material design? Oh, do you know about tailwinds? Oh, do you know about, you know, do you use stylus or do you use, uh, SCSS, you know, or do you use whatever, um, SAS. Th these are all words that are from the CSS realm. And it's really important as a beginner that you know what those words mean, but it's, but it's not as important as a beginner that you know how to do all of them. So you can just kind of get your a handle on so what those things are. So the difference between all of these, that we've looked, all the material stuff we've looked at so far, is that it's designed to go with a framework. The difference is, is it CSS, is it that Tailwinds 
is just for CSS. So what it does, it is a JavaScript thing, uh, but the result of a Tailwind build is just HTML and CSS. There's no JavaScript. Let me say it again. Like when you when you use Tailwind like this, and then you build it, what you get as a result, you, you still have to build it, unfortunately, but but yeah, <laughs> but what you get out of it is you get a an interactive, um, you I mean not an interactive, you get a, you get a an HTML and a style sheet that goes with it, and then the, but the the compelling thing about about Tailwinds that really has me interested is that when you change any one of these things, it changes it automatically. So you don't have to, they've taken all the standard things you might want to do around corners and, and that kind of thing. And, and they've just put it all in here so that you can just change a setting, literally change a setting with the previewer and you can see it change in real time. So, so, uh, uh, we don't need to know. Right. So, so that's right. So like, for example, when we talk about CSS and SAS and all this stuff, it is important that you see that these things exist and you can at least discuss what they are, but you don't necessarily have to choose to use them, particularly if you're deciding to go into cybersecurity or something like that. You don't need very much CSS at all. Um, but you definitely would need to know a lot of, of JavaScript and a lot of the DOM and a lot of HTML. So this is mandatory learning for any technologist is to learn web stuff. I'm sorry, it just is. Um, people take me up on that all the time, but I really think you have to learn it. So as you can see, uh, the styles are just changing by changing things here. There's no, there's no CSS at all. You don't even see the CSS. Um, and, and that's why I'm bringing it up as kind of a debate topic. So best practices don't actually work. So the reason he's talking about best practices, and I'm going to hint on this already, and then we're going to get, we'll be back, back in the book. Um, but when we start talking about best practices here, what we're really talking about is what happens when, and this just happened to me, I had to throw all of my CSS out because it had gotten so out of date and I wasn't using it anymore and it was just ugly. And so I just got rid of it all. And when you're starting, but that's just a tiny site. That's just like RWX Rob Live. That's, a, that's not even a site that's got more than 500 lines of CSS. But when you're starting to talk about a bigger application and that bigger doesn't have to be you know that much, this 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 little file has already got 44 lines of CSS in it, and this is not even that much. This is just a stupid little, you know, thing we've been working on. Where is it? Where are you? Here we go. You know, there's nothing to this, right? We have like background colors and stuff, but we centralize things. Uh, Linux, right? So, my, the point I'm making is that it can get complicated. CSS can get really complicated and that one little file can grow into thousands of lines and that file has to be loaded every time by every person who's using your site. Um, yeah, we do need tree shaking for CSS. That would be really nice if we had that. Tree shaking is when you have something and then it gets dropped so it doesn't take up memory and waste time. Uh, it would be really great if you could tree shake before you published it because then you can get rid of the stuff that you don't actually need. Um, uh, the Tailwind probably has thousands of CSS code we probably won't use. They might be doing tree shaking to get rid of extra CSS, but maybe not. Right. And, and that's, that's what tree shaking is. So now you know what tree shaking is. Tree shaking is when they include a bunch of stuff, but then they drop it if it's not being used at some point. Some point, sometimes they do it before it ever gets published. Sometimes they do it after it's been loaded into the browser, so it doesn't take up extra memory, but you just don't know. Uh, and, and React is one of the big ones, right? React has got tons of stuff that nobody's ever going to use, and it's a good thing that they're now you know, starting to get rid of that stuff so you don't have a lot of bloat. Um, uh, let's see. Do you not import some of these style options? NPM, I'm just using... Oh, NPM does. Not come with all these options out of the gate. Uh, it does come with these options, but you have, to, you have to make them. You know what I mean? So if I want rounded corners, that's a part of CSS already. Um... The, the big reason that people look at Tailwind is because very complicated projects can be easier to maintain. So I don't think it's something that you should get into right away, but it is really, really hot right now and everybody's talking about it, but that doesn't mean anything. In the web world, it, a month passes and it's like an eternity. 
uh, uh, you know, it's like what you knew last month is always constant. It's one of the main reasons I don't like what front end web development because people are always chasing whatever the current trend is. In fact, it's such an issue in the web that they've, they've coined a term framework fatigue because the frameworks are swapped out so fast that nobody can finish anything because there's already a new thing that somebody wants in the thing. So they have to swap that out and then they're constantly redoing things and adding new stuff. And then somebody comes up with a new framework while they're in the middle of the other thing. It's a, it's an ongoing problem where people can't just settle down on, you know, and it's particularly a problem in applications development. It's not so much a problem in, and if you just stick with web documents like we've been doing, because it's all simple, right? Uh, next JS is another one. Uh, yeah, Next.js is, is, is a good one. There's uh, 11Ds. Uh, there's a static site generators. I mean, there's just there's just so much that if you're a beginner, the reason I'm kind of getting into this is because I at least want you to know, number one, that this stuff is there, and number two, that you don't have to care about it. You just need to know generally that it's out there, that you're going to get inundated. You're going to feel like, particularly in web development, it's going to feel like you're, get, you're seeing it from the fire hose every day because they're constantly sending you new stuff. And, and these frameworks are make things easier, but every time you throw out a framework and learn a new one, the cognitive overhead is really heavy. It's the heaviest expense of any project is training. And so you have to completely, you know, learn thing something more, right? Uh, uh, there you go. Once you get a handle on, this is an important one here. Once you get a handle, one thing that sucks about Tailwind is once you get a handful of it in your projects, it's a pain in the butt to write CSS again. All right, so and that's probably the final reason I'm glad that came up that I wanted to show you this. When as soon as you start telling anybody that you're learning web development, they're immediately going to have a million things for you to do and go study and learn. And right now, as a beginner, you need to tell them to just shut up and let you focus on the basics. And when you get the basics done, then you can say, "Okay, everybody, tell me your favorite framework and why." And you can let you can let them all duke it out and decide which one that you're attracted to. And you, you can make let them make their case. Look at Next.js; it's another big one. Um, and at that point, then you know you're gonna want to do that. Uh, okay, Tailwind just clicked for me, and now I feel like blah. Um, I don't know. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. Like Java or C or C++. Uh, great guy. Yeah. <laughs> Can we? Yeah, it's pretty funny. Uh, yeah. These are all these are all great people. I mean, they might not be doing things that I enjoy uh, as much, but they're still good people there. I don't want to throw the whole front end group under the bus, but it does it does seem like they are less interested in. I mean, you understand? Just somebody who's like who cares about you know. Uh, engineering and cycles and stuff, you know, an, an extra widget that flies across the screen is, is cool and fun and everything. But, but I'm like, why are you doing that? That's completely inefficient and a waste of time and energy and resources and money. And it was, yeah, but it's fun, you know? And I'm like, I'm not that guy. <laughs> it's like, like, I'll watch people like, and believe me, I like fun. Don't get me wrong. I like to play games and stuff. But I see people like making like little things float from the screen when somebody drops in Twitch and stuff. And I'm just, I just, I just shake my head. I'm like, why are you spending your time? Because it's fun. And I, I realize that I'm judging them and I shouldn't do that, but I, that's just my style. So when I read stuff about, about things like this or CSS in general, uh, I get, I get a little bit triggered because I, you know, the, the best CSS is like the, the, the least amount of CSS and no site even needs JavaScript unless you're doing an application or you're supplementing it. Uh, data, you're supplementing data that's already in text with some visual form. I, I don't think any JavaScript should be in any web page unless those two criteria are fulfilled um, myself. But the, people would say that makes me a boomer and I'm old school. And I was like, I don't care. I, I've watched our web come to a screeching freaking halt over all of this JavaScript crap and, and, and the extra unnecessary CSS fights about, you know, having which framework you're going to have it in and everything. But the fact of the matter is, is that's where we are today. So uh, I'm going to pause right there, and I'm going to end our conversation about Tailwind versus CSS. And we're going to go back into CSS, but I just want to conclude that the reason I did this little preface rant is sort of to give you a lay of the land and also to help you understand the conclusion, which is very much in the spirit of Jen's book, uh, which is why I like her book so much, uh, even though it's really outdated, is that she's constantly emphasizing usability and, and asking the question, why? 
why are you adding this? Is it making it better? Is it making it, uh, uh, you know, is yeah, the web we deserve? Is is it making our experience, your user experience, simpler? Is it making? Are they being? Are they being? Is their experience being improved? Is this, this experience of humanity being improved? And and if you're using a, a, a any kind of technology that prevents uh, you know, language and words and knowledge from being archived or being accessed by the blind or, 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 you know, just being readable for God's sake. Um, then, you know, you need to ask yourself, why are you doing it? And I just, I really wanted to punch that particular point before we dive into CSS because CSS is all about look and feel and shine and, and all of that. And, and you can, it's so much fun. It is really fun. But it's also one of the areas that you can start to go off down the deep end and you can have trouble because, you know, you can start to do really crazy animations and stuff like that. Uh, that'll be completely useless to, to everybody reading it. And that's fine. It's, it's fun to do that as long as, you know, you're not sacrificing, you know, the, the content value and the, the, the reliability of it and all that. Uh, the ethics reader. Ooh, that looks really good. Uh, really push some material design. Uh, interesting. You cannot make any actions without JS. The moment you click on a button to log or hit enter, you've interacted with JS. That is not true. Uh, the moment you click on, you can click on buttons and submit form data without any JavaScript whatsoever. Uh, true story. <laughs> and there's no JavaScript. So we learned forms and we did forms without any JavaScript at all. And the idea that, you know, you have to have it for event handling is, is true. But it's also not a part of the fundamental thing. Uh, oh, totally can. We just did. We spent four hours filling out forms and entering everything in the form without a single line of JavaScript. Yep. Uh, the only time we needed forms at all was to interact with specific JavaScript elements in the form, such as like dragging. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so you know, that's. <laughs> It does worry me a little bit because when you have experienced front engineers saying that you can't process a form without JavaScript, you got a problem because you obviously can. And the the overwhelming, I mean, that's just a, it's, it's just indicative of 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 how people think. People are trained to think that you have to have JavaScript to have a website today, and that's just not true. It's just not true. It's not true even slightly. And, and, and I just, that's why before we get into CSS, you can have a website without CSS. You can. Oh, it's the ugliest sin. You know, we never do it. But you can do it. And you probably should do it. In fact, there's a common thing we used to be taught a lot in the, in before. It's like you should always turn off CSS and see what your page looks like without it. And if you can make sense of your page without CSS, and I'm not talking about using links, even though I do use it for that, but, but just a web browser, can you still read it? So, um, let me give you an example of that, actually. Uh, I recently broke my old web page. Um, and so, uh, and this is, this is no styles whatsoever. So I broke how my page finds styles. Now, this is just a log, of course. There's going to be swear words in here and stuff, so I'd be careful. But as you can see, the, this, these, were not, these were not divs. They were just, you know, the whole thing is visible. And you can use the thing at a minimal level. And, and see that, well, that one's not because the, the, the link is not, I'm just showing you one that I broke on purpose uh, on accident that, that shows that you can do this. But you can actually break your site on purpose and check whether it's usable and readable without JavaScript. And, and then, you know, you can, you can see how it goes from there. And that will help you make decisions about, like, what this stuff looks like. Let me give you an example of another one. So if I, if I turn off, uh, where is it? Um, well... I, I don't know if it's interesting to you, but you can turn off uh, rxrob.live. See rxrob. I don't know if it's worth going there. I'll I can do it, but you can you can go to sites and you can turn uh, you can turn your site off. And um, so let me just preview this one really fast. So I'm gonna actually break it temporarily. I'm going to turn this link off. So there's no, no, um, no style. Actually, this one, ha I can't do this one. This one's very easy because the styles are embedded. Yeah, I embedded styles in this one. Anyway, just turn styles off and you can get a sense of what something looks like. 
Um, all right. So next thing. Um, let's go back to the book now. Okay. So I need to find a TP on that. So, uh, All right, so let's write save this down so if people want to skip all that ranting, they can. Uh, yes, it can. Yes, it can. It absolutely can. In fact, the old days, that's the only thing you could do. There was no JavaScript. People did server-side rendering, which we, is still a thing today, but it shouldn't be. Um, all right. Uh, da, da, da. Tailwind, CSS, JavaScript way. We talked about that. Canvas web. All right, so let's go back, find the um, the book and uh, benefits of CSS. As we said, you can precisely move things around. I think I'm going to paraphrase. The most para most powerful reason to use CSS, in my opinion, is to make the style change depending on how the content is being viewed. It's called responsive design, but it doesn't even need to be called that anymore. It's just called good web design these days. They don't even call it responsive anymore because it's expected. And we haven't got to it yet, but the, the addition of the media query, I think, is the single most important thing that ever happened to CSS. Uh, and nowadays, people are saying that you shouldn't use media queries. I'm not kidding. I, I actually want to turn to the chat on this. But when we get to the media query topic, um, I frequently hear from professional they read about from professional front-end engineers that media queries are bad that you should never use media queries anymore and i don't know where that is coming from uh they they i believe it's because they think the component model media queries can mess things up and change uh size and stuff and i don't know we're gonna have to we're gonna have to get more information on that but as we go through we'll understand it better Elsie says, in the most basic sense, that is why tags like H123 should be used for semantic meaning, yes, for the first heading, and not for this should be a bigger font. Right, exactly. And that's really, really core to this question of semantics and stuff. Um, more, more accessible sites, that makes a difference. Uh, come to think of it, there really aren't any disadvantages to style sheets. Um, browser inconsistencies, that's gone away. Power of CSS. I'm not talking about minor visual tweaks, and that's what I'm getting at. So this Zen Garden, by the way, we're going to go see this Zen Garden, but uh, this, this this Zen Garden is a dated technology. Uh, it's still fun to go here, but this is this is dated at this point um, because components, you know, the whole reactive approach uh, doesn't like having all the styles in one place. Um, so... But this, this CSS Zen Garden, this has been around since the 90s. This is a way for you to change exactly the same code into a different uh, style. So for CSS base. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, CSS Zen Garments made locally. Video of CSS, let's see. Um, I'm trying to figure out one. The idea here is that you can change the exact same HTML into multiple different versions of just by changing the style. Uh, here it goes. See that? The Road to Enlightenment, littering a dark and dreary road lay, right? So, I mean, as you, you, it's almost like you're, you go to them and you're like, no, this has got to be different. It is a different site. Uh, CSS Zen Garden, The Road to Enlightenment. So what is this about? Every one of these is using a different set of style sheets, and that is it. That's the only different. Look, look let's like look at all the designs. Um, oh, sad. Sad. They have a broken link. I think this is view the, des the designs, CSS. CSS resources, submitted design, translations, CSS3. I, used to, I mean, they've been doing this for years. And Century Moderna. Again, exactly the same site in a different paid way of showing it. Um, it's kind of fun. CSS Zen Garden. 
the point is the style and where things appear. Uh, you can even have animations in CSS. In fact, uh, one of the, another, I mean, if you want to see, if you take CSS animations to an extreme level, go to codepen.io if you want to see a bunch of experiments, almost all of it's CSS, but some of it's JavaScript. And just search for anything. So like X-Wing is my favorite. So this was actually created with an application. And don't think anybody actually wrote all this. Um, so this, uh, it's much my, my computer fan come on. It's like, I can't do this. It's, it's really choppy because my fan is going off. This entire animation has no JavaScript in it. You see this? No JavaScript. The entire thing is all CSS. There's not even a canvas in here. So what I'm trying to say is you can do a lot with CSS. It's very powerful. Uh, and I mean, this is another one. This actually has JavaScript in it, though. So yeah, you can go play with these things. You can play with them like all day. This is a canvas. It has a canvas in it, too. Um, but if you want to get examples and ideas or just want to find a really good button, you can go here and look at that. I, I mentioned Copen in the beginning series, but I want to mention it again. All right, so back to the book. Uh, any comments? It's getting really powerful. Yeah, it's been it's been powerful for a while, but it's even more so. Uh, no, it's not. One piece of JavaScript to change the link CSS, and that's it. Works with JavaScript disabled. Yes. Ooh, I didn't know that. You could turn that off. I hadn't tried that. Pronounce scuzzy, <laughs> scuzzy data. Is it pronounced scuzzy? SCSS? I don't say scuzzy. I say SCSS. Scuzzy has a different meaning to me. <laughs> I say... <laughs> No. Shout out Alkins Code Pens. Oh, that would be really fun. Who I'll, I'll have to definitely. Um, so so Code Pen is a really great way to show off, and as you get your skills better, it's a great way to go learn as well. Uh, it's worth mentioning though, since we mentioned CS uh, Zen Garden. Um, uh, misery days of yours. Developers were given a table based layouts. Forget it. Don't even. People used to use tables to decide where things went on the page. I did it. We all did. Um, so how style sheets work? So you get these different looks here, but all of them are a side to the same thing. Writing rules. Okay, so then we're going to break into rules. Let me take a quick break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about specifically the syntax of CSS. And and I don't know how far I'm going to be able to get with that, but we'll definitely do that. New Year's display. Oh, he did. Using canvas, nice. Um, so many cool things. Let me see if there's any other comments I missed. Um, like, hey, Piot, how's it going, Ilich? You can rice your Linux. <laughs> you definitely can. <laughs> Chip says subtractions are hard. That's true. Uh, it looks like Google's bootstrap. Yes. Uh, chat is an IRC. Yeah, you need to just click on the link, Mr. Bullshot. Just click on. Um, uh, chat dot um, uh, rwx. Actually, just go to rwxrob.live and you'll be able to see the chat link. Media queries aren't going anywhere until designers understand responsibly. I completely agree. Uh, how to work with Flexbox and Grid. I completely agree. Yep, Flexbox and Grid are the replacement, but people don't know them. And that's one of the reasons that I really think people should learn them is because, I mean, CSS Grid and Flexbox, let's just be real, they are really important. They're really... It's really, really important, and I couldn't believe how easy Grid CSS Grid was to use um, for my, you know, my little project. Um, so I'm looking forward to having you guys learn that. Um, any questions from here? XN says, "Hey, hi. I was able to join very easily. Nice. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna just take a break to let my voice rest for a bit, and I will be back in a, like 10 or 15 minutes. I will say, and when we come back, we're gonna dive right into the exact syntax of CSS." So you can understand we've been playing with it all the time, but we haven't really explained what it is and how it works. And she talks about that in the book now. All right, so stay with me. I'm going to put, um, let's see, uh, away. Away until 12, let's say, uh, just 10 minutes, so just 12.30. Go get a drink, go take a break. And syntax.
You can go back and watch the previous videos if you need to. Get it, get in the IRC, whatever you need. Framework of Razor, I'll move to nice. Yep.
Is that even something you can do? I don't think you can convert Flash to HTML. We got a couple minutes here, for a minute before we start. I didn't think you could even do that. It really depends. Uh, yeah, it's just such a massive change. I can't imagine that that even being a thing. There's probably a few tools out there, but I don't know what I mean. I think the answer is just no. Apparently there's tools. Before the 2020 deadline. <laughs> Without the source files. All these people frantically and stuck trying to convert from Flash to HTML5. <laughs> I won't lie. Do you know what that does? Yeah, Schadenfreude, Freude, Schadenfreude. <laughs> That's my answer to that. <laughs> if you didn't convert before the end of 2020, if you didn't get off of Flash before the end of 2020, yeah, I think you're going to need to restart the system <laughs> from scratch. But you're going to learn a lot in the process. Yeah, you might you know pick up one of these. You actually. Say, say what I want about all these frameworks, including React, but they're better than Adobe Flash. All of them. So that's one way to keep pr proper perspective on everything. Um, all right, let's take, change this, uh, this topic back. So let's do um, CSS. Did I say it right? Shutter Foida. Something about Freud. I'm going to use that with my wife. She's, she's German. She's there talking to her mom, her German mom right now. Uh, Alright, so. Making up a document. Alright, so. Uh, oops. Uh, CSS uh, structure. All right, so I'm saving up this. This so I have bookmarks everywhere. So CSS structure. Um, let's just look at the book like we usually do. I'm gonna scan through it, and then I'm gonna cover it myself, and then we'll hit the high points so you can read it. I don't feel right reading it word for word. So. You have a file, as you saw, and inside the file you have a selector, a declaration, and a, a, a declaration block. Now, I've heard declaration blocks also called rule sets. In fact, I think the official name is rule set. Um, but we'll, we'll stick with that. Uh, so I've heard them called this. I've heard this is called a rule, and this is called a rule set. And this is called a selector. Um, and actually, I'm going to confirm that that is actually the terminology. Um, and, and see, you now you know what? You know what? I also don't know. I probably should know this. I don't. Um, where is the CSS specified? Where is? C I'm pretty sure it's W3C. As it's not what WG. It's a different language. Remember. Uh, I. Uh, I'm pretty sure. So this is something we should probably look up. Um, I don't want W3D schools is not the place to go. I mean, it might have answers, but it's, it's definitely not the spec. Neither is Mozilla. Mozilla Network is not the spec. It's a good resource, but it's not the spec. Um, uh, do, 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 where, what is CSS? Developer, first steps, learn what is CSS. Go looking web pages. CSS specifications. Ooh, let's read about this one. Uh, what does it say here? CSS cat settings style sheets allow you to make great looking web pages. How does it work under the hood? Uh, HTML, the defaults used by the browser. 
bli blah blah blue 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 fast forward syntax come on tell me where this where the spec is specification specification there it is Ooh, is that a link please be a link that defines the technology see below <gasps> come on all right here we go css specification is what Oh, I don't know about this. Let's read it. All web standard technologies, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, etc., are defined by giant documents called specifications, specs, we know this, which are published by standards organizations such as W3C, WebWG, ECMA. We did WebWG a lot, so go back. That's the number one place to go for HTML5 above everything else. Um, you, know, you found it. It is W3C. Thank you, Elsie. Um, let's go open it, shall we? Let's go do that one. Um, oh, wait. Well, put it with links first of all, and then we'll we'll open it with graphics if we need to, which we probably do. Uh, media queries right on the top page. Media queries level four must be a new thing. CSS two point one. What the heck? Please tell me that's not the actual site. Please tell me this is not the actual site. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt here. I mean, I really am going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to turn off Dark Reader, first of all. Oh. It was Dark Reader. Dark Reader does not play nicely with the... <laughs> You know what it is? They have, they have, this is interesting. This means that there's some overlying thing on the whole thing that has got some like kind of gradient on it. Yeah. Dark reader trolling. Check it out, man. That means they have a background. There's a background on here. I Now I have to know. And now we know how to look that up. Remember? Now we know how to look it up. I, yeah, it's probably, I bet you it's a color gradient that's indistinguishable in the background. I bet you anything. Because they have this little thing going on right here, right? Oh, so let's go see. <laughs> Inspect element. Um, I'm going to say, what are you guys going to bet? They did it on purpose. <laughs> so HTML has a background. Yeah, look. Background repeat. Yep. Yep, yep. That's what it has right there. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> wait 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 oh wow now it's pretty why you know why because turned it off yep i turned it off now what wait why it's all good now what happened now it's <laughs> dark reader neutral okay wait 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 color it's, it's a filter all right if i turn this off I have to reload, don't I? Damn it. No, nope, that's not it. <gasps> because this one is still doing it. Nope. That's not it. I, I know it's... Well, this is... Look, this is supposed to turn it off even though it's not refreshed. The intended layout. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Scroll bar colors. Ooh, look, they're even playing with the scroll bar. Don't hit F5. Well, here's the thing. It should be, it should be taking care of the background thing. Without this, it's not though. I mean, these these changes are supposed to be instantaneous. It's not supposed to have, you know. Oh my god. I mean, the whole point of having a CSS change here is so that you can change things without having it, and have it, and you'll see it immediately. All right, so there we go again. So padding, I don't know, man. I know I'm 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 I've lost interest. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh. I think, I think no, I think they're using gradients, and 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 Dark Reader doesn't know what to do because it just inverts everything. That's what I think is happening. It's done something similar. Watch if I go to watch this. So if I go to live streaming over here and I go to click click on this over here, watch what it does. So this is, 
this is uh this is this is this is really crazy because this 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 screen is all dark mode but other stuff in studio is not dark mode it's really really crazy but if i if i change and put dark mode on uh yeah yeah the live css should have changed but look at this when you put this on it makes it transparent in the weirdest way oh it's not doing it right now anyway it normally does that it's like dark reader doesn't play nice with some things some things it can be real a real pain on all right so let's go back to what we were doing we were trying to figure out the the uh the spec oh, i have to like i get my eyes are burning um why are media queries on the front page i don't understand someone tell me why media queries are on the front page is, is it because they recently did a thing on this that's the only thing i can figure is it's like the most recent thing they did they put on the very top uh so far i'm not this is not inspire confidence uh css remote try part of the page all righty will do roger wilco okay so yeah this this is what i'm used to yeah it's the most millennial thing they did <laughs> um this this right here is what i'm used to i think this is the actual spec uh, I'm gonna bookmark it. So guys, yeah, LC sent you the spec there. Um, and yeah, so so yeah. And then what we're gonna look up? We were looking up to see if uh, if they call it selectors or rule sets. I want to use the right proper terminology. Life is in the definitions. Hey, look who's editing it. People from Google, an invited expert from Fanatasia. And another invited expert suggested an edit for this spec in the GitHub editor. You can actually open the whole thing. Overview.bs. <laughs> who, who invented the term? Who, who invented the mime type .bs? <laughs> That's as bad as us using federated... Federated Universal Knowledge Workers. <laughs> Seriously, did you see this down there? Look at the link at this bottom link. Overview.ps. Um. <laughs> this specification is BS. True fact. This specification is BS. I, I, I can go all day with that. That is just like hilarious. I I just cannot stop. Anyway, I'm having fun. I'm sure there's a lot of great people doing amazing work over there. Uh, I, I just had, I just could not resist. I mean, people should think about these things before. They, although I didn't. I did. I had, I had universal, what was it? I had the Federation of uh, uh, Federated was it um <laughs> i had universal federated uh knowledge workers and it was like yeah it was, it was bad yeah let's let's, let's keep it family friendly because this is family friendly but i didn't even notice it was that and they're like you realize what the acronym is and i'm like oh whoopsie and so now we're keg yeah knowledge exchange the knowledge exchange grid keg are you on keg put that on keg where's your keg Tap my keg if you want to know more. <laughs> I cannot wait. Fridays, by the way. Fridays. Fridays, we talk about the Association of Federated Knowledge Workers, AFK Works. Come join us. We have a lot of fun with that. Well, we do things like specifications, which is why I feel entitled to make fun of this one. Uh, keg gang, yes. Um, uh, purposely done, just like ours, right? This this specification needs more seconds. <laughs> I know. We're all 12. I uh, 52 going on 12. <laughs> <laughs> We're having fun though, right? I mean, come on. How much fun can you make reading through a specification? <laughs> we have to have some way to make fun. Um, okay, so something serious here. Uh, what else we got? All I really want to know is what it's called. I hypothesize currently 
that calling this a declaration is incorrect. I, my hypothesis is that that is supposed to be called a rule set and a rule. And, and I wish to know the answer to this. So I'm now going to proceed with my research. You can help me with this research if you'd like. So let's do it. Let's find... I don't even know how to search this thing. So F. Wait. Wait. Please, please work in links. Please work in links. Please work in links. I'm begging you. That will be so much more effective. Wait, we already did it. That's not going to work. I think I just crashed. Why is my system crashing and doing all kinds of stuff? Um... Uh-oh. Things aren't good. People, I'm like getting slow for some reason. I'm like running out of memory. <laughs> yeah, that's even worse. Why am I getting all slow all of a sudden? This might be the end of our stream here coming up. Whoa. Whoa, who's pegging it 100%? I, OBS, as usual, is not happy. I think it's, you know what it is? It's all the snowflakes. Yep, I'm pretty sure it's the snowflakes. My computer does not like snowflakes. It doesn't. It doesn't like them. It doesn't. It's like chat's lagging on your end too. Um, yeah. Uh, all right, so let's do this. We'll go through the roadmap. Wow, that's so much faster. So let's go for uh, rule. At rule index. Select your index. Terms index. What is that about? First length, second matrix, second length, absolute length. Rule. I want to find a rule set. I could have swore it. I guess it's not called a rule. Syntax in CSS3, the syntax. Oh, there's the syntax. Here we go. Ah, booyah. We found the master of all syntaxes. Wait, wait. Damn it. No, that's that's not it. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. I need to edit, edit. There, we need to go to CS. We need to go to TR. What does that give us? Oh boy, that is the wrong thing. We want to do this. Wait. And then we want to do CSS roadmap. Why didn't it go there? Hmm. I don't want that. I want the whole thing. Uh, is it just CSS3? Do, do, do. Selectors. Syntax. There we go. CSS syntax level 3. I, I, so there was talk about a four. Did that ever really become a thing? Uh, probably not. All right. Module level three. Apparently this big old thing is the right thing. Um, so then what? Abstract. This module describes in general the basic structure and syntax of CSS style sheets. It defines in detail the syntax and parsing of CSS, how to turn a stream of bytes into a meaningful style sheet. A uh, good chance it's been written in EBNF too. Uh, blah, 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 style of the document. This is produced by the CSS Working Group. All right. GitHub issues are preferred for discussion. Nice. Uh, publication as a candidate recommendation does not imply endorsement. Patent policy. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Come on here, baby. We want intro. Let's go to the intro. Section is non-normative. This module, blah, 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 code points. Yep. So it's all Unicode now, thank God. 
uh, module interactions, description, just declarations, right? Style rules. What did I say? This whole thing, this whole rabbit hole has been to define what to call these things. Uh, a qualified rule. A style rule is a qualified rule that associates a selector list with a list of proper declarations. Property declarations. Hmm. Oh, oh, look. They are also called rule sets in CSS2. Well, that explains everything. I'm so glad I went down this rabbit hole because I learned CSS2 and then I learned CSS3. So this means that in CSS2, it was called the rules and rule sets, but they've changed the terms. Apparently, they're called selector lists and all those key value pairs are called property declarations now, which means that Jen's book is right. And it isn't a rule set anymore. That would have been CSS2, CSS3. Maybe that got updated. Maybe. That would make sense because I would I would imagine she's like really up to speed on, on CSS because it's her main thing. Uh, encoding for text CSS, UTF-8, it does. It's Unicode, Monbon. They said it. Now, I set it up above. Uh, it said Unicode, but it didn't say whether it was UTF-8 or 16 or whatever. Um, I'm almost positive it's always UTF-8 though. Yeah. Oh, whoopsie. Uh, the concept of environment encoding was added. The behavior does not change. Uh, here we go. New formats, a new linking mechanism. Oh, that's different. That's not the same. You, do, you see you know what I find interesting? Look at the spec. They, they deliberately leave off. You see here? They leave off uh, quotes. Because quotes are completely optional. People will yell at you for leaving quotes off. As long as it's not bad, you know, like have characters in it, then that's perfectly fine and clear to read. Um, so UTF-8 encoding. Though UTF-8 is the default encoding for the web, there are many newer web-based file formats that assume or require UTF-8 encoding. CSS was created before it was clear which encoding would win and thus can't automatically assume the style sheet is UTF-8. Did you read that, Monbon? That is interesting to me. Style sheet authors should author their style sheets in UTF-8, and in, this is super interesting, uh, and ensure, uh, uh, yeah, people use quotes too. Uh, you can, I use single quotes too sometimes when I can. And ensure, and they are fine under HTML5. Uh, and ensure that e either an HTTP header or equivalent method declares the encoding of the style sheet to be UTF-8. Wow. That means that UTF-8 has to be declared in the header of the request for the style sheet. That is so interesting to me. Uh, or that in the referring document declares its encoding to be UTF-8. In HTML, this is done adding meta character 8 into uh, element to the head of the document. If neither of those options are available, authors should begin the style sheet with UTF-8 bomb to the exact characters. What? A UTF-8 bomb, that big bomb is like one character at the very beginning, and it's usually skipped over by parsers and stuff, but that is super fascinating to me. And this is, this is, I know beginners, you're like, what are we even doing? We talked about UTF-8 being the standard for all texts today. Um, it's what allows us to put Unicode emojis inside of our texts. Um, we put a meta character char set UTF-8 in the HTML header so that the web page that's sent up by the web server knows to send it as UTF-8 as an HTML HTTP header, and otherwise your emojis won't work. And uh, you know you can use emojis, by the way, in CSS, but you need to make sure that somehow the thing receiving your 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 style sheet gets you gets notified that it's UTF-8. Now, what I find interesting here is we put uh, char meta, meta character set UTF-8 dash eight. Uh, for the HTML, but does that mean that the that the style sheet that's linked in that's in a separate file does that infer that that's also UTF-8? Well, there's only one way to know that, and this is definitely not beginner content. And I'm, you can skip over this. I'm going to put a skip over here. This I'm going to put a topic. I'm going to say uh, I'm going to make a little note here. Give me a sec here. So I'm going to make a topic. Um, uh, let's say uh, R CSS. Let's see are separate CSS files assumed to be 
UTF-8. And I'm going to put that, and then I'm going to change this a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to back up on this a, a little bit too. So, uh, well, I mean, people can back up on this too. So let me just recap while I save this. All right, so, we, so somebody asked a question about while well, we're going through the CSS, if it's uh, defaulting to UTF-8. And we happen to be in the specification. I think this was brought up in the conversation. And uh, so we have the, the spec open right here. It's uh, right here is the, where is that? Uh, CSS dash syntax dash three, and we happen to find this this really interesting passing paragraph. This is not beginner material, but if you've been following this at all over the years, uh, you might find this this interesting. Uh, UTF-8 was a default encoding for the web, uh, and many newer web-based file formats use it. But CSS was made before then, and thus you can't assume it's UTF-8. However, style sheet authors should author their style sheets in UTF-8 and ensure that either the HTTP header uh, or equivalent method declares the, the, the style sheet is UTF-8 and in HTML you put it in the meta character set element to figure that out. So if neither of these are options are, op are available then the bomb which is like a single weird character at the beginning of a file should say what type of thing it is. Uh, so with the, with the UTF-8 bomb at the exact characters. Um, it makes me think that we should probably put at char set UTF-8 at the very beginning of the of the document. Uh, document languages that refer to CSS style sheets that are decoded from bytes may define an environment encoding for each style sheet, blah, blah, blah. The concept of environment encoding only exists for compatibility with legacy content. New formats that link the mechanisms should not provide an environment encoding, so the style sheet defaults to UTF-8 in the absence of more explicit information. So it goes without saying that, that it's going to do the right thing these days. It's just going to be doing, doing an UTF-8, but you don't have to worry about it. I, I am mildly curious, though, if I request a style sheet, if it's going to put a HTTP header in there, it's going to tell me exactly what it is. And so, for that reason, um, I'm gonna I want to attempt a little a little trick here. So, we already we have this server running right uh, up on our local server, just using the Go library, and and then it's on localhost 8080. And if I can just yeah, I can get the the basic thing there. Uh, uh, but or I can go get. Uh, but what I really want to know is if I get assets slash styles right. Dot CSS that'll just open up the style sheet right. But if I curl that thing, I want to see what the headers are. And and that would be dash i. So there's the headers, and there it is. There it is. This is really fascinating to me because the. This means that even the Golang built-in net HTTP library that we use to build our server knows enough to associate .css as the suffix, which is the only association that it would ever know, as saying, oh, that's text CSS. Here comes a char UTF-8, char set UTF-8. If this line were not there, according to the specification, then we would have to provide some other way to ensure that whatever's using it would, would assume UTF-8. So that's that is a little bit of a rabbit hole, uh, and I'm going to return back to the main to the main topic at hand. But for the more advanced people who have been watching the bio remark, yeah, question, uh, the, the more advanced people who have been been following this and following HTTP for some time, uh, I find that interesting because I, I do know for a fact that you must put a char set in in here. If you do not put a char set in here. Uh, you will rue the day. I, that was not the best example because we were just messing with that one. Um, if you don't put a char set UTF-8, you will be burned by that, I promise. Uh, Nginx, by default, does not set the char set for HTML to UTF-8. And so if you put emojis and all of a sudden there are squiggle weird things, then that's what's going on. So just to be safe, you, obviously you can go in there and change it in your server and almost all hosting services, including Netlify and GitHub pages and everything. They do the right thing. But you want it anyway because if you're going to go preview it on another Nginx server at some point, you don't want to get burned later because you don't have your UTF-8. It's one of those items in boilerplate, and you can go back in the video when I talk about what boilerplate is, that in your personal boilerplate, you probably want to make sure it's there. And frankly, I didn't, I didn't put it there consistently until this year uh, through a lot of this research we've been doing as we've been going through these different boosts. So now I know something new. Today I learned that, that uh, CSS is not assumed to be UTF-8. It has to be told, the server has to tell whatever receives it that it is UTF-8, and that is taken care of in the header. So, fun little side note. 
Uh, and, and that's, I think we've captured that well. So somebody coming into the video can, can go back on. I'm going to go back and change our topic back to um, what we were before. Let's do, uh, so CSS uh, uh, rules. Okay. I'll go back to CSS rules. And I, we're only going to be here for another another hour, twenty minutes or so, and then I'm gonna we're gonna wrap it up for today. We'll be doing another one of these tomorrow, by the way. And uh, so, what do we got here? Let's go into the syntax of the rule. We, I, I dove down. I'm gonna just summarize. Uh, I dove into uh, uh, the specification for the sole purpose of figuring out what to call the stuff because I saw that Jen calls it a declaration here in a declaration block and property and a value. And I was falsely remembering uh, that these are supposed to be rule and rule set. And when we looked in this CSS3 specification, it very clearly says that the terms are property and declarations and, and that CSS2, which is what I originally learned, called them rule and rule set. And these kind of words matter to me, so I was trying to pick holes in the book a little bit and make sure it was true. It turns out I had it wrong. So I'm really glad to clarify, clarify that. Um, but this is the syntax. You just, you have a selector, one or more selectors. Uh, there's all kinds of really awesome selectors now, by the way. Um, and then you have a property that you want to set a value on and then the value itself and a semicolon. When I watch beginners and me, when I do this, the number one mistake is missing the semicolon at the end of a declaration. It will trash your whole declaration, sometimes even your whole CSS file, by missing one semicolon, and it won't kill you, it's doing that. So um, just be really careful on that one particular point. Um, you know, you have your editors that will help you out there. Um, let me check in with the gallery before we continue. Nope, no new comments there. Uh, any new comments from the YouTube? Nope. Any new comments from Twitch? Uh, a few. Uh, to confuse learner with mobile first early without understanding what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Some designers to work with Flexbox. Yes. Uh, we're not going to do uh, mobile first right now. We'll talk about it eventually, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Uh, the idea of mobile first is, is to... Uh, we've talked about this several times on the stream. Uh, just to remind everybody, unless anybody has any question, I'm going to show you the objective evidence that says everybody should assume nothing about what the device is. But but if you do want to assume and say, well, I and there's not that many mobile users, right? Just do this. Okay, search for anything like Media Query, right? And come down here, and somebody on the stream actually showed me this. Click on Usage Relative. What is the most used web browser in all of the world? Chrome for Android. That's a mobile device running Chrome for Android. 37.52%. And by the way, that keeps going up. Last time we saw it, it was like 36% or something like that. It's like, it might have been, I might, no, I can't remember. This number changes. This number represents a source of statistics from all over the place. And this is how most web pages are viewed, websites. So if if you're gonna assume a base, then do that, and that's where mobile first comes from. Uh, the idea of mobile first has largely been overtaken by just make good sites for all devices, and and don't you know worry about uh, you have to pick one first, right, and then make adjustments adjustments as you go, and uh, people will do that. From they'll make a site that looks really good on a mobile device, and then they'll make it look good on other things. And I used to do that. I still think it's a great way of doing it. I don't think it's required, though, personally. Um, some people get really bent out of shape if you don't do it that way. Um, so let's go down here. So selector. What is a selector? The selector is the part at the front. Uh, and we're going to talk about all those things, what they are. Uh, you have the declarations, which are the group. There we go. You have the properties, which are each of the, the colon whatever properties. And then they go ahead and they make their first style sheet. Well, we've already made a style sheet, so we can just go back in and review the one we may already made. Um, and then how to attach the style sheet to the document. We also talked about that some time ago, but I'm going to review that again as well right now. Um, and there's, uh, let's see, big concepts, inheritance. Okay, we'll talk about that next. 
uh, I think big concert is probably going to be where we're going to end for the day uh, because I I feel like we're you know doing a lot here. So here is let me let's go pull up our style sheet that we've been working on and. So, first of all, let me just ask you off, off the cuff. Where are the three places, as anybody know, that you can put a style? And I want to remind everybody about this because when we talk about selectors, it's going to become important. So, the first place you can put a style is inline. And, and this is becoming more popular now with component-oriented design and things like that. Um, so, the first place you can put a style is inline. Um, so if I wanted to size the image here, I would have style equals whatever, and you can put a bunch of properties now that I know they're called uh, with semicolon separating them, and you can do that. And that's totally acceptable. Uh, in fact, I do that on one of my sites because it's just it just makes more sense for this teeny tiny site that I have. Uh, it makes much more sense to do that than to go full blown and have a, a separate file for it and everything. Uh, I'm going to show you. Give me a sec here. So this, you know, Artifacts Rob Live is just a single page, so there's no reason to break everything up. Just to it would slow down the page in that case, because uh, it's not that much content. Um, and pardon my like internal. So here's my styles, and the styles are in a script. I'm sorry, the styles are in. A, this is number two way to do this. Put all the styles inside of a style tag someplace in your document. But I also have the first way, which is inline. I thought I did. Maybe I moved it. Yeah, I did. I think I moved it out. I did. But if I wanted to, I could have put a style um, right in the in the middle of uh, right right in the middle of of the element, right? And the problem with that is it's not really centralized. You can't. You don't really know where it is. And usually when you want to add a style, you want to add a style like a class. You want to say, I want to have it be pink or something. And then anything that you put a style pink on becomes pink, right? So, or something like that. So inline is the first way. And, and you know, it would be, it would be like this, right? So it'd be style equals uh, color pink. And you can put a semicolon if you know you're going to have another, another thing there. So what 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 is that? This Linux. So let's go see if let's go see if if Huzzah is pink, shall we? I think I'm gonna have to change the background on that, but we'll we'll find out. So so we'll go to Linux, and there's Mr. Torvalds. And if we go to Linux, yeah, see it? It's kind of pink, right? It doesn't look very good, but it is pink. So you can do styles inline, uh, which is generally considered a no-no, but it's becoming more common with components these days. Secondly, you can embed styles inside of the document, which I showed you already with mine. That doesn't make sense for me to have two uh, websites. So I actually have a styles hashtag. Now, it's important to know that the style itself is not, um, uh, the style tag is not a part of the CSS, right? It just marks out, marks where the start on, and the end of the style CSS is. And this is all CSS in here. And then the third way, of course, is a separate file. And, and a, a separate file is what we're doing here. When you have a separate file, you have to have a link. And this is one you should memorize. Uh, link equals style sheet, rel style sheet, which doesn't need these quotes if you don't want, but you know. Um, and this does, though, because it's got slashes and dots in it and stuff. So, and then you have rel and href. Rel equals style sheet, href. That's one that's worth memorizing. So I've got a link there. And then what? So then I, where did it go? Well, it's in assets. And you have to make sure your paths all match up. So here is a style sheet that is living all by itself as styles.css. Uh, it doesn't have any, you know, it, it, it plays well with all editors and everything because there's no HTML and CSS intermixed. Um, and it's just easier to manage. All right, so those are the three ways. So let's break this down. We have uh, style selectors. And then we have the rules. Let me do it with my mouse. So here's the, the selectors. Uh, here's the declaration. And here's a property. OK? And there are three main types of selectors. There's like some 20 some odd types of selectors. But the three main ones are 
selectors that match HTML element tags. The opening tag will match the element. Uh, they have ones that match the class attributes. So class equals checkboxes, right? Or radio, class equals radio buttons. Uh, then that would match. It just so happens the names are similar to what the elements would be. But this is because it has a dot. That means so. And then uh, what do we have? You can uh, underline pink. This one. And then you have ID selectors. So anything that has an attribute ID equals. You can use a hashtag. So those are the three main selectors to remember. Plain old elements with no prefix, class with a dot, and IDs with a hashtag. Uh, when in doubt, use a class. Uh, the reason is because you can combine classes together by putting a space in between them in the attribute. And then all of those classes will apply to the single thing. Can't do that with an ID. With an ID, it's meant to be, no, that is the ID of the thing. And it does not mean, by the way, according to the definition of the specification, it does not, when you put multiple IDs on a thing, it does not mean that that particular thing is unique and that it's the only one with that ID. Uh, you might initially intuitively think that that's the way it is, but it actually isn't. You can have multiple things with the same ID and, and that's not even bad practice, uh, even though it might be counterintuitive. So uh, that's... That's uh, the beginning of CSS there. So let's touch base with the book again. Um, and I think we covered it all. I mean, those are the real main places to put things. Uh, we talked about external embedding and inline. Uh, uh, the values, the properties, the values of the properties vary widely. As we get into each of the individual properties, we're going to be talking about lots of stuff like you know, like units, how much of a measurement of a thing. Uh, and, and by the way, when we're doing all of this, the easiest way to get your head around properties is to just mess with web pages. If you like inspect element on here, you can see all the different things that are on that element, right? And, and you can mess with them and you can like change them up, you know, and just kind of really just explore. Um, over here in your, in your inspect element thing, uh, you have uh, Chrome or Firefox. Computed is your friend. So layout will show you things related to margins. This is really, if you if you think you're, you're like, why is that thing not lining up? Well, it's probably because one of these things isn't set right. Computed, however, is really valuable. Computed tells you on any particular thing, you're like, why is that thing yellow? I didn't make that thing yellow. How come it's yellow? There's no yellow in my style sheet, right? Because why? Because we did we did the, the sinister bad thing about doing an inline style. So I'm on that pink thing, the pink huzzah, and I can go see, okay, where is it getting this color from? Where is it getting this color from? Where is this color coming from? I have no idea. <gasps> okay, there it is. So its color is pink. There it is. But who made it pink? What made it pink? You can say, this dot style, oh, element. All right. So by looking at that, I can obviously I can see it up here, but I can see that that was set to be pink by the style element, and I can even test what that looks like if I remove it. Um, and I click here, and it'll go back to normal, right? So that's like back to so. So, computed is your friend. Computed, when you get all this cascading stuff going on, uh, it's really hard to know what is winning, particularly when people start using imp important, which is a way to really mess with the whole cascading thing, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, but in fact, I think I should talk about that. We're going to talk about cascading at the beginning of the next session. So if you want something to do, go in and make your web page and practice using one of each of those three style sheets. Make sure you can link your style sheet in, uh, make sure that you can put a style attribute, make sure that you can use, um, the style element with its opening and heading, opening and closing tag. And also make sure you can use the link rel equals style sheet, href equals styles.css someplace, and load that file. Make sure you can do those three things without any problem because that's where we're going to pick up tomorrow at 10. And um, selectors in this book, that they're only going to cover a few selectors, it looks like, which is good because you can get really confused by them. They're really powerful. Today is really, you can select by by attributes now, which is just amazing. You can actually, yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, and the values depend on the property. 
making your first style sheet. So there's your exercise. Make sure you do that uh, if you haven't already done that. We did ours already, and, and I feel like it would just be rehashing it, but make sure you get that done. Uh, and as we get on to, we'll talk. So tomorrow we're going to talk about the big concepts, which includes the whole cascading thing, what it means about inheritance and how stuff comes together. And, and that will be the focus. Uh, and I think that's a good place to stop. Let me go ahead and just check with the chat. If you have any questions so far, I, you, if you're not asleep, <laughs> I'm going to go to sleep too myself. Uh, uh, then, you know, you can go through it. Uh, if you need to take, take little bits and pieces of this, I understand completely. This is so much more fun when you're doing it yourself. So I really hope that if you're watching this, if you're not watching this this way now, you should have me, like if you have two monitors, it's better. But if you have like one monitor and another one, have me like playing up in the corner while you're working on some project. Like, and you're just literally just messing around with CSS and just listening to me kind of in your ear. And I'm kind of secondary. I don't, you don't need to pay me much attention. What you should be doing is practicing this stuff yourself and messing around with it and getting your hands dirty because that's how you're going to learn it. You're not going to learn it just sitting here watching me eating chips, you know, and, and on the 16 inch monitor or something. No, you've got to get messy and play with this stuff in ways that are going to help you to learn it. Okay. So some of this stuff might be informational, but that's really critical. If you don't do that, you'll never learn it. So make sure you do that. Uh, if you put a little extra effort in, you won't just get some random crazy intro analytics site. You might actually have a site we're sharing that you can put in your portfolio. So maybe find a topic. I have this happen all the time. I had a, a 12 year old uh, a girl uh, put together a site of her own that was uh, about elephants. She absolutely loves elephants. <laughs> She's got this great elephant site with a little flex box, you know, menu and everything. And she's totally taught herself almost all of it just by reading about it and researching how to do it. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. I'm going to end today. Uh, I will uh, probably be back tonight um, to do other things, but I'm not going to be doing this. I'll be doing, you know, random work on probably my personal profile, uh, which I need to get in line for job applications and stuff. Um, long story short, but uh, uh, so I'm out there with you, you know, doing it. I have a great job as a mentor, but I'm also looking for the full-time employment. So I'm going to be putting a lot of this to, to in practice as well, making my own portfolio site, uh, which I've helped, you know, hundreds of other people do. So it's just a matter of me doing the same work. I'm no better than you. I'm just, I, I just, you know, happen to have been exposed to this, uh, at some point, um, along the path. Thank you for all the people who followed uh, if you did like it, please make sure to like and subscribe. I, have, I don't have to tell you that. That really helps me. Not so much because of the money. Uh, I mean, that does help. But because it helps like visibility so that other people can be helped by it uh, and uh, who find it. And so uh, this video will be posted. All the links are in there if you want to jump around so you can get to the right thing. And I'm going to take off now. So bye.